If you are willing to get close to people who are suffering, you will find the power to change the world. So reads a quote from Brian Stevenson that perfectly describes the incredible work of Mr. Brandon Stanton. Hey everybody, this is Neil Pasricha and welcome or welcome back to chapter 63 of three books. Yes, happy harvest moon, everybody. October 1st, 2020. Look up to the sky. That thing is full. And can you believe this year that we have had? It has been wild. It has been crazy. I have been searching for grounding myself in the midst of this pandemic. The blahs, the ups, the downs, the stresses, the school stuff. The should I scrub this watermelon stuff? The what's going on with masks? Do we wear them outside? And what's going on? It's overwhelming. I have been searching for grounding myself. And today, I'm going to give you a conversation that completely filled my soul. Mr. Brandon Stanton is an American author, photographer, blogger, activist, and philanthropist who runs the viral sensation, Humans of New York. Do you know Humans of New York? Are you one of the over 30 million people who follow this blog on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter? The arresting daily photos of humans and their accompanying stories. The photos are, as Brandon would say, subservient to the stories. Brandon Stanton is also the author of the New York Times bestseller, Humans of New York, which came out in 2013, and the 2014 book, Little Humans of New York, as well as the soon-to-be bestseller book, Humans, which drops in a few days on October 6th. So grab a copy now if you don't have it already or haven't pre-ordered already. The new book is called Humans. I have had a chance to flip through it, and it is incredible. Brandon was listed as one of Time's 30 Under 30 People Changing the World. He's received the James Joyce Award for the Literary and Historical Society for Professional Achievement. Guys, this is somebody who's completely self-taught, right? Picked up a camera because he liked to press the button. Wandered around the world taking pictures when he was working as a bond trader in Chicago. Left the job at lunchtime, left the job on the weekends just to take pictures of architecture. Does he know anything about photography? No. But his heart led him into interesting conversations with interesting people and documenting them into a viral sensation that reflects back to all of us the deep soul of humanity inside us all. In chapter 63 of three books, we're going to talk about so many things, including what mistake Brandon made while shooting Barack Obama. Wait till you hear his story about being in the Oval Office and how uh, I won't won't ruin the surprise. What mistake did he make while shooting Barack Obama? What's the difference between schooling and education? What system did Brandon use to improve his own reading habits? How do you balance artistic ambition with family and contentment? How do we learn how to tell better stories? How do we tap into our deeper artistic selves? What is freedom? And how can success limit it? How can cannabis help with creativity? But why also at the same time should kids fear drugs? How can we rebuild trust in society? And of course, what are Brandon Stanton's three most formative books? As I mentioned, this conversation completely filled my heart, filled my soul. And in the crazy from Fram 2020, up, down, sideways, media onslaught, political like election, let this conversation be an oasis of energy to fill you back up. Let's go. Okay, I think we just hit record. Hi, Brandon. Hey, Neil. Uh, Man, thank you so much for coming on Three Books. I really, really appreciate you taking the time. I know you don't do, I know you don't do many interviews by Googling you and the interviews you've done, I feel like I hear the same five questions. So we're gonna, I just appreciate you coming on and I'm gonna like try my best to give you new, new stuff to chew on. Absolutely, and if you wanna ask the same five questions, I won't mind. (laughs) 
Uh, how'd you come up with the idea for Humans of New York? What's the greatest story you've ever heard? How do you interview strangers? <laughs> you, you, you did your research. That is accurate. Those are the top five. Um, and then just before we get going, I, you know, I used to do these only live and in person. So I'd always spend the first five minutes describing kind of where we were. And it's hard to do that virtually. But if you don't mind, could you just I'll, like I'm sitting, I can tell you where, what, like, what, what are you seeing right now? Where are oh, you man, approximately? I don't, I don't know if you even want to know where I am. Um, <laughs> so I am in a small, we're visiting Austin, Texas right now. Um, you know, I'm working remotely on the blog, uh, and that's going very well. So I decided to kind of take advantage of that and, um, you know, travel a little bit with my family. And Austin was about the farthest place we could get to without getting on a plane. So we drove to Austin um, and we've got a very small Airbnb, um, which is smaller than our U New York apartment, actually. And so my daughter is taking a nap in the other room. Uh, if, she, if she wakes up, you will hear. And so I am in the second bedroom on the bed. It's not very glamorous. And I also get the sense, Brandon, from listening to all these interviews with you, just hearing you talk for so long is that, you know, you may do on peanut butter jelly sandwiches for a long time. You didn't grow up with, with wealth. I, I get the sense that you also live a very, am I right? Like, do you live pretty simple and basic yeah, and you know, cheaply? I spend, I, I spend I'm uh, pro, pro, prolific. What's the word when you spend prodded, prodded? Prodigious? Product, whatever. One of those words where you spend too much money in certain categories. Promiscuous? Um, no, like financially? I, I, eat out, I eat out a lot. Um, I travel a lot. Um, so I spend a lot of money there. Um, I I will wear my clothes until they have holes in them. I've got, you know, I wear the same 10 shirts uh, that I've been wearing for the past several years. Isn't that years. a business uh, move though? Like you can't go up to someone and ask them for their story if you're Cladded in Gucci and Prada. I think you're right. No, I, I really think you're right. Um, not even Gucci and Prada, but just like, you know, I've just, I've always dressed down like my, you know, my entire life. But, you know, it's not even a Gucci and Prada, but like, you know, just when you're, there's so many people whose style speaks for their identity. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like they communicate something with their style. Um, a lot of times it's, it's, it's something, you know, very, very bold. Um, and, you know, I think that is something I want, want to avoid when I'm walking up to somebody for the very first time. Uh, so, you know, my clothes are very plain, you know, there's, they're just t-shirts and jeans and Henleys, um, and, you know, old tennis shoes. Um, yeah, I'm never I, very stylish at all. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's not for the purpose of work. It's just kind of naturally, but I have reflected on how kind of being dressed down and just blending in, you know, I just don't want to stand out in any way. Um, it, I think that does help with the approach. Yeah. Plus you're, if I'm right, six foot four, right? Like, right. Well, yeah, it, dep you, it depends. You um, don't blend in already. Like you have to yeah, work to blend yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, it depends upon what day, some, somewhere between six, three and six, four, depending upon whether I'm feeling like, uh, minimizing myself or maximizing myself. <laughs> And I noticed on the on the dressing down and jeans and a t-shirt, I noticed you did look uncomfortable on the YouTube clip I watched of you photographing Obama in the Oval Office uh, for Ohoni, you know, with with I a couple special guests. I was, I was like, you were dressed probably, up I there. Probably, I was probably uncomfortable for several reasons in that in that situation. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the suit and tie. Uh, did, did I look uncomfortable? No, uh, no, no. Actually, I, I shouldn't have said uncomfortable. But I when I saw you walking in the suit and tie, it caught it me really that, normal. oh, my gosh, I've never seen this guy dress up before. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, no, that that was something a little bit different. Um, you know, I tend to I tend to dress down whenever I can get away from get, get away with it, including in meetings, including on stage, um, you know, wherever, wherever, um, you know, I'm not going to horribly offend somebody. I will mm. wear, you know, the the most limited version of uh, what I can get away with. I love that. And uh, uh, that's, it's amazing. Like it works like, like <laughs> proof is in the pudding. And, um, and on that Obama visit to the white house, I know you've had connections with the office many times and he's commented on your posts and, and so on. But um, is there one thing I haven't heard you talk about is, is there anything that surprised you about that trip or when you, when you get to that level of power and we're going to talk about power in a little bit here with one of your books, but like what, 
you are the wanna, you are oh, a master a, of thing. observation. Here, here, here's a little here's a little twist for you. I actually brought him a first edition copy of the Power Broker to give him. No but way. they told me that I wasn't allowed to give gifts, so I couldn't. It was a signed first edition copy because Barack Obama, first of all, he gave Caro um, one of those medals. I don't know if it was yeah. the Medal of Freedom or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but in giving him the medal, he said that Some everything- Some medal. Yeah. Uh, he said that everything um, that he learned about mo- modern politics, he learned from that book. Uh, so yeah, there was, there's actually a, uh, some synergy there and some, a connection between the power broker and that visit. Um, you know, as far as the Obama visit, uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's some backstory there. I, first of all, I was, I really idolized the man from a very young age. Um, you know, at the age of 19 or 20, whenever that was, when he first gave that speech at the democratic national convention, I was very moved by him. And I went on to, uh, campaign for him. Uh, I went to several states and knocked on doors for him. This is in 2008. And so then he got elected and, you know, the, the blog started getting big around 2010, 2011. And, you know, I always, it was kind of a dream and a goal of mine to interview him. And, you know, the opportunity came in 2015, um, in, you know, alongside the fundraiser that I did for the school in Brownsville, that was the impetus for the invitation. And uh, I remember being very. What was the? Um, apologize, to, I don't want to slow you down here. Give us the no. one or two sentences on the school in Brownsville. What were you trying to do there? Oh, it's hard to you know do that in one or two sentences. But I was doing Humans of New York. I ran into a random young man. He was about fourteen or fifteen years old on the streets of Brownsville, Brooklyn. Uh, in the course of photographing him, I asked him who inspired him most in life. He named his principal, a woman named Nadia Lopez. I ended up going back the next day and finding Nadia Lopez and interviewing her. Um, I was so impressed by her and her school that I spent the next two weeks at the school interviewing students and teachers while raising one and a half million dollars for the school. Uh, in the end, we were all three, me, the young man, whose name is Vidal, and Nadia Lopez were invited to the White House to meet with President Obama, at the end of which I was going to get some time to interview him. So that's right. the setup. Okay, that's, and, and that I, takes us up to 2015 now. Yeah, and I already told you a little bit about my history and my background, so I was very excited about meeting him. Um, and the the actual meeting itself... Um, you know, I, I actually left extremely um, disappointed. Uh, he seemed very distant. He, um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, the guy is a consummate professional, so uh, especially with the media. So he said all the right things and he photographed perfectly and the post ended up being extremely popular. Um, so like professionally, it was, it was kind of a peak of my career, but personally I left, um, very disappointed because I was kind of looking for, um, you know, a moment of connection, uh, you know, a moment of kind of authenticity of, uh, and he seems kind of, um, hurried and he seemed a bit distracted. Um, and I left, you know, feeling that, you know, maybe, you know, this, this image and this, um, cause I'd read dreams from my father. I, you know, I'd, and I, you know, that's who I was hoping to meet. Uh, you know, the, you know, I was hoping to have a second with Barry, uh, from that book. I hope that's not disrespectful to say, but no, you know, no. from that book. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it just wasn't there. You know, I, 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 I almost felt like the time that I was in there was imposing upon him, uh, which I mean, it probably was. I mean, who knows what was going on that day? Mm-hmm. So anyways, I left, um, I left a little disappointed because I felt that there wasn't a, um, a kind of genuine moment that I was able to, to share. Um, and I'm not even talking about words. I'm talking about energy. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm, Cause I talk, I talked with him a bit about, you know, how I campaigned for him and just nothing really seemed to be kind of landing on a personal level. Mm. Uh, and so I left very disappointed and I kind of, you know, carried that disappointment for several months when I got invited back to photograph a Syrian refugee who um, was coming to America that I interviewed in Syria, ended up being invited to the State of the Union um, based on that interview, which was another big deal. 
And anyways, I was going to I was going to the State of the Union, and this was absolutely wild because I ended up riding the presidential motorcade. It was like last minute. I was I wasn't expecting it at all. I was just I was, they just told me to show up. And I <laughs> you there photograph. get into the twelfth black car under the <laughs> helicopters. <laughs> that, that, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. They like came to me right before it left, and they're like, "Look, you know, we just had somebody drop out of the motorcade, and uh, there's a spot <laughs> we, there. we had a last minute <laughs> cancellation." <laughs> yeah. So Desmond Tutu I, I, isn't going to make it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I rode, I rode in the motorcade to the State of the Union, which was just an insane experience. Not who was in your car? I guess you're not with oh, Obama. It's the last car in the motorcade. You were correct about that. Probably the twelfth car is a certain legacy news organizations always travel with the president, uh-huh. and so there, the last car is the press pool. Um, but obviously, it's very competitive, and there's very few spots. And for some reason, somebody couldn't make it there, so they threw the honey guy in. So there you're you're in there with a bunch of reporters. Yeah, exactly. Well, not a bunch. There's just like four or five people in there. Um, and so we got there, and I just waited outside, and then actually go into the State of the Union. And then at the end, he came out, and the plan was he was going to take a quick photograph with all the guests, the official guests of the State of the Union, of which the Syrian refugee whose story I had told on the blog was included. And the plan was I was just going to take a quick picture of the two of them, um, and that was going to be it. So I had zero expectations, because keep in mind, I had done an interview in the Oval Office where I had extremely high expectations, and you know I didn't really get a moment um and so i was coming into this with zero expectations and we're in this long line we it's like winding into this room and suddenly the line starts moving quickly so clearly the president's in the room and they're ushering people through and it's going and we're in the very end and it's you know moving forward moving forward moving forward i'm nervous because even though you know i've i've got this wide following for my photography i'm not a very trained photographer the light was low i thinking i'm going to mess this up it's going to be blurry they're going to be mad at me i'm mm-hmm. going to whiff it um and i have like so, 1 second to do this yes exactly <laughs> like, um and so i got to the front of the line and um the president took a picture with Dr. Hamo, who was a Syrian refugee. And the first person to take the picture was Pete Souza, who's the official photographer. He took the photo and then the president kind of started walking away. And Pete, God bless his soul, said, you know, Mr. President, um, Brandon's here. Uh, And then he looked and he kind of pointed at me and he goes, there's my man. (laughs) And I was like, what? Like, I, I, I seriously did not even think he would know who I was or remember me. You know, that's how little of an impression I felt that yeah. I had in the previous meeting. Yeah. And he walked up to me and he put his hand on my shoulder. And just in the least political, least performative, quietest, most authentic voice he possibly could said, I just want you to know that you're doing really important work. Ah. Oh. And I just, uh, I mean, oh, I, I, it just, uh, it was unbelievable. Oh. I was, it was like, I was, I was it's walking like he was t- holding your heart. Cause I'd idolize this man. You know, I, I just, from a young age, you know, you don't idolize people like you do in those formative years. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when you're just, when you're trying to figure out. No, not world. just you. Can I just say he, the campaign of hope was the, it was the most inspiring campaign almost any of us had seen before period. Right. Like maybe since JFK or something, right? Like, so it's generational once in a generation, this type of hope fills a whole country in some sense. Right. And you were 19 years old and now the guy's in front of you with his hand on your body, looking you in the eyes, telling (laughs) you that you, Brandon, you are doing important work and, and you you had no idea you, he even knew your name never because then last time he wasn't really quite present and, and like, yeah, well, take and, me, and keep, what, keep, take me deeper did, here. And, and what it did is it like, you know, it kind of made me realize that what I had done to him, 
is the precise thing that Humans of New York hopefully educates and encourages people to not do. I had judged a person by a moment. Mm. I had Mm. been in this presence for just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And when you're meeting somebody like that, when it's somebody that you admire that much, and especially for somebody who's very hard to access, what you tend to do is you tend to grasp on to every little gesture, every little tone, every little piece of data you can have because it's so valuable because you're being given that access yeah. and you want it to mean something. Yeah. You want it to give you a glimpse into the person that's not available to people who were not given that access. Yeah. You know, it's like, think about every time somebody meets a celebrity, well, plus, you know, they're, for oh, the rest they're the of- nicest person. They were the exactly. nicest person. And all they might've done is smile. It might've been something so small. Yes. But you you latch on to that one little piece of data you have uh-huh. that nobody else was given yeah. to extrapolate and form this special opinion of the person's personality mm-hmm. and who they are. And the very first moment that I was given was so important to me because I'd been waiting for it for so long that I extrapolated so much into who he was. Uh, you had no cho- you had no choice but to extrapolate it. That was all the data you had. And well, I mean, it, it, out of context, it was. Yeah, but then right. again, I'd been, you know, I'd been interviewing people for the past ten years. That if I bumped into them on the subway, and you know, both of us were heading for the exit at the same time, I might have thought to myself, "Oh, what an asshole!" Like blah blah, you know, just yeah. those kind of yeah. typical knee jerk New York reactions yeah. that you have. Declarative labeling. Navigate. Around, but then you sit down with that person for an hour and a half and you learn where they came from and you learn their story and you realize that you can never judge a person in a moment. And it's precisely what I had done to him. And then I'm given a entirely different moment um, several months later when it's a completely different side of the person, a more relaxed side of the person. Uh, you know, he just finished a big speech who knows what was happening on that first day that I met him. You know, we could have been on the brink of nuclear war. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was a pretty eye-opening experience for me, um, you know, in addition to being able to meet somebody that, you know, had loomed so large in my life in two different scenarios, but also kind of as a lens into, you know, my perceptions and how even though I'd been doing this work for 10 different years – you know, I still had these same blind spots and I still had these, you know, tendencies to categorize, uh, based on limited information. Interesting. Wow. What a, what a cool takeaway from, and and like also how fortuitous that like most people who meet Obama once for 15 minutes or whatever, which I'm sure is, you know, a million people, very few of them get a chance to do a redo three months later. Like the three months later thing is a mate, like that you had that chance. To give you yeah. that, to give you that I mean, insight, yeah. I mean, it was uh, it was interesting. Cool. Well, uh, listen. Uh, uh, the opposite of a moment is a seven hundred page book about somebody. Um, <laughs> and uh, you mentioned nineteen twenty is kind of when you got really interested in Obama. Well, I think around the same age, Brandon, somewhere around there, you're going to tell us you read Benjamin Franklin: An American Life by Walter Isaacson. So this Mm -hmm. book was published in 2003 by Simon & Schuster. Isaacson, born 1952, New Orleans. Like this guy, you know, is is kind of polymathic himself. He's a journalist. He's an author. He's the former CEO of CNN. He's the former CEO of the Aspen Institute think tank. He is the former editor of Time Magazine. The cover of this book has got this old-fashioned kind of blue scrawl. I mean, I want listeners to picture it like you're standing in a bookstore. Right across the top, there's a painting of Benjamin Franklin kind of zoomed in, sort of like the like the one on the currency. It has small circular glasses, long wavy hair, uh, the puffy white shirt. You guys can file this one under 973 uh, for history. Uh, of the Revolution and Confederation, that's for Dewey Decimal Heads, or you can file under 989 for autobiography, uh, autobiographies of Benjamin Franklin. Um, I want to know, Mr. Brandon, Brandon Sand, tell us about your relationship with this book, Benjamin Franklin, An American Life by Walter Isaacson. Um, 
Well, I mean, it's all it's all context, um, which is why I, I ribbed you in your in the email. I said uh, you got when because I had chosen first. I, I chose the autobiography of Ben Franklin, yes. which I have to read right after the regular biography. So they they're interchangeable. Yes, uh, and, and I said I said Gretchen Rubin picked that one in chapter five of the show, and you said you said you should let I, double I, picks. But yes, but the, the, but the same book is two completely different things to two different people at two different times, and which is why I. I kind of laughed and I said, you have to let people choose the same book because it's just going to have two completely different meanings. And it's, it's going to, it's going to be two entirely different, you know, uh, titles or narratives or whatever. So anyways, I mean, it was all about what was going on in my life. Um, I had flunked out of school. Uh, you know, I was, I was 17, 18, 19. I had this feeling that school wasn't for me, that it was stifling, that these kind of cookie cutter assignments where you're expending your time studying parcels of information based on some sort of set schedule as opposed to based on your own curiosities or your own desires to to learn about things. Um, and it didn't seem to be leading towards any sort of general purpose other than to get the grade, to get the degree. And I really felt that I was being shuffled along and I rebelled against it very hard, um, in, in the way of, you know, not doing my homework. That's kind of light part of it. Darker part of it was doing a lot of drugs, um, experimenting, you know, some of which I think improved my perspective on the world and some of which I think were harmful. Um, you know, I don't lump all drugs into the same category, but you know, I was definitely doing a lot of them. I flunked out of college and I reached this point, you know, and and during this entire time, you know, I was trying to figure out what am I here to do? You know, what is this, what's this, all of this stuff seems so minuscule, so small, so narrow, you know, what is the big picture thing? Why am I on earth? what is truth? What is meaning? You know, what's it all about? And I'm sitting around trying to figure these things out all day long. And in the meantime, all my life's crumbling around me. You know, I'm flunking out of school. My parents say, don't come home. Um, The only people who would take me in were Why did they say, don't come home? Um, You know, I think they were just tired of it. And it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me too. Tired of what? Tired of me not living up to my potential. Really? That's, they, that's the thing that they felt for a while? Oh, I mean, yeah. And I mean, to, to fully understand, you'd have to go into my family's history and my parents' history, which, you know, would take two or three hours. But, you know, based on different life experiences and, and their upbringings and, and things that, you know, they had gone through, um, you know, they're, they were trying to guide and shepherd me along the path that they thought would most protect me and most lead to, um, my independence and my happiness. And, you know, they were, they were encouraging me. Is that sort of like the East Indian inside of me has immigrant parents? Is that sort of like, you know, get good grades, go, go to college, get, become a, you know, Indian culture is like, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be an engineer, be an accountant. Right. And it was just, you know, it wasn't that extreme, but it, it had echoes of that, you know, whereas in your, your, your value is the grades that you make. Um, but again, you know, this is all in what, this is all their, what they think is best. You know, it's not, it's not something that's, that was, uh, malicious in any way. No, no, of course. I, I didn't mean it that way. I just, yeah, when you said yeah. can't go home or don't come home, I was, I thought I was like, interesting. Like my parents mm-hmm. still, I'm 40 years old, Brennan. They still say, why don't you move back home? <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. So it was the, it was the opposite of that. And I think, you know, it was kind of a forcing me and what it did is, I mean, it forced me to get out of my head. Um, that's where I was living. You know, I was living in this world of ideas and this world of thoughts. And, you know, I ended up going to live in my grandparents' basement. Um, I started working at Applebee's. Um, I started paying my way through community college that I had to ride the bus to every day. I basically had to completely start over. And I pivoted and I changed from doing you know, figuring out what I wanted to do to doing the things that I needed to do. Just getting, you know, 
getting my life into place and moving forward one step at a time. And I just started checking the boxes. And instead of just sitting around and trying to think of the big idea or have the big moment of inspiration or the wave of passion, um, you know, I started to kind of divide my life up into things that I could do, objectives I could accomplish. And the first big one, and probably what remains the one that changed my life the most, is I decided that I was going to read 100 pages every single day. And, um, one, uh, you know, I, I, the first book I picked up, it was like the piano teacher or something like that. I don't remember much about that. Um, the second book I picked up was the biography of, uh, Benjamin Franklin. And I think it was just probably, it had just recently come out. It was probably prominently displayed in the library of the community college. And I picked it up and it, it couldn't have been better timing because here I am trying to structure my life and, and trying to build some sort of framework that I could I could start moving forward and quit stagnating. And uh, I stumble across this man who was the almost the inventor of self-help and the, and the master of you know, of self-improvement. He, he really was. I mean, like way before the sort of like Dale Carnegie, you know, who's way before the Stephen Covey, like there's this guy, Benjamin Franklin, telling people how like they should run their day and how they should schedule their time. And how, this is like the OG self-help book, really, or the OG right. self-help guy. And just the, yeah, and just the example of his life, you know, the somebody who was always seeking to improve himself. And then, you know, I think wrapped up in all of it, was this feeling that this 18 and 19 year old hubris, 20 year old hubris that I was too smart for school and, you know, all this, you know, memorization and these, this algebra and stuff was, you know, below, below, um, I should be thinking about more important things. Do you know what I mean? And I just remember, you know, one of his lines in poor Richard's almanac, it was like uneducated, uneducated something like uneducated genius is silver in the mines uneducated where, genius is like silver in a mine or in the mine before. pardon you've heard this before or did i say yeah this you've before? said it, first of all you've said it before and then i looked it up because you okay. said it um yeah, yeah. and I, I was just like whoa i thought i was the only one who knew that um and it was like you know it's it's just basically saying it doesn't matter how smart you are. If, if you don't have knowledge, if you don't take the time to learn from other people and learn what's been learned before, you're just never going to do anything near what you were capable of doing. You know, and, what's so crazy, Brandon, uh, is that you're like the same age, just to say you, this quote strikes you. And as I repeated it back to you, it struck you that anyone else knew it. Uneducated genius is like silver in the mine. At the same age, I was graduating from high school. We all got a little column to put like, a, you know, hey, love to Cindy, like girls for, forever. And and like I just put a quote there and the quote I picked uh, was me at age 18 trying to be profound was um, a Mary Beard quote, which is education uh, without action is futile. Action without education is fatal. And wow. it was like the same idea that I was like, there's got like, I'm just like, <laughs> there's more to this we got to figure it out and then and learn yeah. it and apply it and I, I had the same almost insight at the same almost age yeah exactly uh, i mean that's it's amazing how similar those two quotes are yeah um and so yeah it just i mean that hit me because i had it, it just made me feel very behind and that i had you know been squandering this time and I mean, looking back, I mean, it was probably very helpful for me to grasp with concepts as opposed to data very early on and really kind of push for those big picture things. Uh, it definitely didn't seem like it at the time, but it probably gave me a foundation and a grounding that serves me today. Uh, but then at the age of 20, you know, I read that and I'm just, I realized I'm not educated. I, I made the grades I needed to make, you know, I... I crammed for the test the night before, um, you know, I, I wrote a buy on, you know, natural abilities and writing and things like that, but I've not really, really educated myself mm -hmm. and I'm already 20 or 21 years old. And 
that just, it really snapped something into me. And it just, again, I, I started reading hundred pages a day, uh, mostly nonfiction. Uh, it didn't matter if it was the little prince or the wealth of nations. Some day it took me, some days it took me 30 minutes, other days it would take me eight hours. Um, but I did it every single day for years and years and years and years and years. Uh, and you know, I, and again, it wasn't for an assignment. It wasn't for, you know, because I was, I, I didn't go on to, you know, I went back to school and I, you know, ended up doing very well. I went back to university of Georgia where I flunked out of, and I got straight A's, but reading that I did for class didn't count. If I, I did reading for class, that didn't count. I still had to read my hundred pages. Yeah, I mean, did, this. Go the, ahead. No, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt. But this is just so inspiring. Like it, it's like it reminds me of that Mark Twain quote: "I never let my schooling interfere with my education." You kind of got this right. like wokeness. You're like, oh, I don't have an education. Like I just went to school. Like those are two right. separate things. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, well, then the being is, and I still think this: like you're not going to read. Anything that you read from compulsion, you're not going to retain nearly as well as you read from curiosity. Well, that's you know, it. And we hammer that out when we give you Great Gatsby to read a great, great nine. You know, like not everyone likes that book. Right, right, right. And I mean, it's the, I, there's just like something, there's some, your brain's mechanism of imprinting information, I think is when it's attached to an emotion, the brain knows its importance. Mm. And that emotion has got to be some sort of inspiration or excitement or, you know, uh, passion. Strangeness, and, maybe, of some kind. Yeah. And if you're reading books that answer a question that's emerging from in you of something you want to know, that's going to happen much more frequently than if you're being assigned a book based on somebody else's agenda. And so, you know, I think educating yourself based on your own um, curriculum uh, is going to lead to a lot more retention and a lot more growth um, than educating yourself in a, in a more systemic format. Um, but I don't know that. Yeah. I don't know that. Um, it's just been my experience. Well, and it's a, it's a, I agree with you. I think that is true. And it's partly why we started this podcast, Brandon, because I was not reading at all as an adult until my wife mocked me for being an author who doesn't read. And uh -huh. I went on a reading spree. I went from five books a year to 50 books a year. I wrote an article about it for Harvard Business Review. It went viral. I start this podcast. Why did I start this podcast? Well, because it forces me now. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's called three books uh, for 333 straight lunar cycles. We publish a chapter all the way up to September 1st, 552 AM, 2031. And what will do is force me to become intimate and ideally read a thousand of the world's most formative books. So I, I force yeah. this system kind of like your 10,000 pictures with, with the map of New yeah, York. Gonna say, yeah, this sounds very familiar. We got the same backwards design of achieving our crazy objective thing going. And then, yeah. but then also I hear this hungriness in you that I totally relate to and I think I have uh, and so I, it makes me think of Benjamin Franklin right I mean this guy I mean, there's, there's like a moreness about him like his Wikipedia profile describes him as a writer printer political philosopher politician postmaster Freemason scientist inventor humorist activist statesman diplomat okay like he's, he's this is all he does all that stuff and, you know and then so for you I'm like I look at I look you up online I mean artist photographer author, lecturer, activist, blogger, storyteller. Plus, I bump into this quote that you said over on the Tim Ferriss show, the world is so amazing. And the fact that we're here is so amazing. And doing anything less than something amazing is squandering the whole reason that we're here. And so I wondered if you could just take me into your, like, take me into that ambition a little bit. I'd love to understand it well, inside I, yourself, what your self-talk is like, you know, and well, take I think, you know, that quote, if I'm not mistaken, was actually um, given in the context of me trying to articulate the state of mind that I had when I was 20 years old. And I wasn't like the, the reason I wasn't plugging into school is because I felt it wasn't inspired enough and, and wasn't passionate enough. And, you know, I think the, the big irony of my life, one of them, is that I completely relinquished and let go of that need to do something great and something important and instead focused 
on discipline and in structuring my life where I can find work that I love and repeat it every single day. And in the process of letting go of that need to do something amazing, um, I managed to accomplish something that was far bigger than I could have ever imagined in those most heady days of sitting in the dorm room, smoking weed, and trying to think about what I could possibly do with my life. And so, you know, the, 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 more, the farther, you know, the faster I started moving forward <clears throat> was the, the further I narrowed things. And, you know, you, li- you, list, uh, <clears throat> you list all those things that, that Benjamin Franklin did. And, you know, it's, it's kind of actually something that I'm, 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 I'm trying to, I feel like I'm getting away from at this period of my life. Whereas in I, now there's just so many, you know, opportunities of things that I could do. You know, I've moved into filming. Um, you know, I've, I've just, you know, I'm directing a film, which was the second major video project I've done. And, you know, I'm starting you to have a new book coming out. <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to be good at everything. And so I'm actually trying to narrow and refine the objectives and the things that I want to become the best at and focus all my time and on that. And, you know, the farther I go along, you know, the more that goes into storytelling. Uh, you know, I want to get as good as possible at telling the stories of strangers that I possibly can. Like that's, that's the direction that I want to in, influence all my other decisions and all my other work. Um, and you'll so, notice photography. Yeah. It's not in, in there. It, yeah. It's not that. It's subservient um, to the storytelling I've heard you say. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what I hear though, Brandon, in that answer is, is like a, a, a a shrinking or or a streamlining of sort of like the girth of your ambition. But what I what I'm also interested in is like kind of like the velocity of it. So, you know, 1920 dreaming about changing the world, that's not an unusual thing necessarily. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are very idyllic and, and, and stuff like that in college. Not to not to say not to take anything away from you feeling that way. But then now flash forward, you kind of done it. Like you have been successful. You have the most viral blog in the whole world. You are, you know, you have multiple New York Times bestselling books. You, you, you know, um, the, the thing is blown up past your wildest dreams. Now talk to me about the velocity of the ambition now. And, and what I'm looking for, and I'm searching this for this inside myself too, um, is like, how does that, how does that play inside your head and in your mind and in your heart with contentment? And where does family fit in? And how do you think about what you might be doing when you're 50 or 70 or 90? And, and I don't mean for you to think about those future years. I know you and I, like our brains don't, but I just mean like, talk to me about that ambition and are you comfortable with it? Do you like writing it out? Do you want to see how far it goes? Benjamin Franklin, you know, kind of messed up on the family stuff a little bit, you could argue based on, you know, so talk to me about the family, how that fits in. I know you don't talk about your family much. I'm not trying to push you to talk about them particularly, but the contentment, ambition, balance in you and how you think about it. That's what I want to know. You know, I I think that we, we can, you know, only one, you know, they say the best that you can do is know yourself. Um, you know, I think that's probably even a little lofty because we change. I think, you know, the best that you can do is know yourself in a given point of time. And, you know, the the things that fulfill me and the things that bring me contentment have morphed and changed over time in a way that um, I expect will probably continue. Um, And so when speaking, when answering that question, I can only speak to where I am right now. Um, And, you know, after a lot of, of soul searching and, you know, thinking, you know, I have um, concluded that I am happiness. I, I am happiest when I'm pursuing something. Uh, I a lot of people like to go meditate, or they like to go sit on a beach in Thailand and reflect, um, and they find their joy and they they find their contentment and and stillness. Um, you know, I believe that. And I mean, I just, I'm extremely grateful for my life every day. I think that I've, I've, I've 
locked into just about the greatest life anybody could possibly have. You know, I have the resources and the freedom to create the art that I want to create every single day. And I have an audience that will come along on that journey with me. I can't imagine anything that's better than that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a place of extreme gratitude and, you know, coming from a place of extreme contentment. And, you know, I think so much of my happiness and my contentment comes from being able to wake up in the morning and have fulfilling work that I can do every single day. You know, there's never a moment when I'm bored and there's never a moment when I'm, when I'm trying to, you know, figure out um, how to, how to fill my time or something like that. And so, you know, at this moment, you know, that is a prerequisite, I think for my happiness is the ability to move towards a purpose every single day, the ability to, um, you know, fall, go to sleep, knowing that I'm further ahead than when I woke up in some sort of goal or purpose that I'm working on. And, you know, I think there's some philosophies that say, oh, there's, there's another level beyond that. You know, you should try to get past that and be still and, and not need to move. Um, but I'm happy. And, you know, I know that this is what makes me happy. So I'm very forgiving of that element of myself. Um, and then the, as far as the family part, um, you know, that's more of a time thing. Whereas in, you know, what I can do, you know, I know that I'm always going to be focused on this purpose and it's very important to me uh, to have a purpose and to be moving forward towards something. And if you want to encapsulate that in four words, it's humans of New York. You know, I, I know that humans of New York is extremely important to me and it plays a huge role in my life and it takes a lot of my time and a lot of my thought. And, you know, the, my, efforts in being a father and a husband are the amount of time and thought that I can take away from that and put into my family, uh, which is a great deal of time. You know, I've, I've been talking about the things that I'm amazingly grateful and amazingly lucky for is that I'm able to have the impact that I have and take my daughter to the swimming pool every single day for an hour and a half in the afternoon. Uh, I am able to put her to bed every single night and read the books with her every single night. I see her every single morning, you know, so it's the, the, the freedom that I have right now, um, you know, gives me the ability to give a lot of time and thought to my family in a way, um, that I'm still able to do this work, uh, which again is, um, you know, something that I feel very thankful and I feel very lucky for. And, you know, the balance, you know, between that is, is one of the great balances of my life and the great, you know, it will, I think probably be one of the big struggles and big tensions of my life is, um, never, you're never going to be able to move one forward as far as you would have liked to, if the other one didn't exist. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you're never going to be able to be the husband and the father that you could have been if you didn't have this life work that you were obsessed do, with. Do you think that's true? Oh yeah. I mean, well, because we only have, we only have a, a minute, a limited amount of, of time. But is that you know the I mean? metric? What now? Is that the right metric? Uh, so uh, I'm Jeff Bezos who, you know, is the richest man in the world, uh, CEO and founder of Amazon, and obviously works a zillion hours a week on Amazon because he's running mm -hmm. Amazon. Um, he says that energy is a flywheel and it's not time that's the metric. It's actually the energy. And if you can measure on energy instead of on time, then him being awesome and kicking ass at Amazon enables him to come home and be an awesome kind of father and like super into being a dad and like ha shows up with great energy and is all in. And then the energy he gets from that, he shows up at Amazon the next morning and he's like kicking, you know, what I'm saying saying is the definition or the paradigm that I've heard him use that I've tried to adopt in my own life and what gives me some peace because I have very high ambition on my work as well. And I'm about to have, mm -hmm. Leslie and I are about to have our fourth boy. We have three wow. little boys already wow. and this will be our fourth. So we've wow. leaned into family really heavy. We want to have lots of kids. We, we, uh, you know, we really want family at the same time, like, you know, I, I'm writing a new book every couple of years and, 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 you know, so I 
but the way I get around my in my head, and maybe this is me like rationalizing, is I think no, it's about energy, not time, and they they a good one in one like pops the other one even yeah. higher. But you know, it's like what I'm I'm going to take an extreme view, extreme example here, you know, to make a point without comparing myself to this person. All right, you, you take Martin Luther King, okay, notoriously not the best father that he could have been. He just right. didn't have the time. Which of the things Mahatma Gandhi, um, Gandhi, you know, exactly. you can go down, Gandhi you can go down the try. list here. Gandhi, Gandhi didn't even try. Gandhi told his wife that, um, look, the higher good is the good of the community. Focusing on your family is a form of selfishness when there's billions of people suffering. It's a form of selfishness. So Gandhi took it even further than Martin Luther King. Um, <clears throat> and then you ask, okay. So which, which of the things that Martin Luther King Jr. did on behalf of the nation, on behalf of black Americans, which of the things, you know, what specifically should he not have done to spend more time with his family? Oh, uh, put, put your finger on it. You, you know think, what I mean? Well, you think, <laughs> but there's also people, uh, Brandon, and, and you know, and you're using Martin Luther King and Gandhi. These are fantastic. But are there not also people that I could point you to that are kingpins or titans of their respective industry or community or have made a mark, you know, a, not to compare change in the world, but are there not presidents and prime ministers that have a wonderful uh, large families and are super all in on their family and go no, trick or treating with so. their kids? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. But you, you don't, don't think, think Obama's a good dad? Think, you don't think Barack Obama, when he's when he's in his room quietly, you know, is thinking about all the time he missed with his kids. You know what I mean? It's like it's. I mean, are there people? It, it's just like it. It gets to a point. And again, I'm not comparing myself to these people. I'm just we're choosing these extreme examples. Yes, yeah. talk about it's a fun. It's a fun that. debate. Yeah, it's like you know, it, it gets to the point where the responsibility gets too great and the ability to impact and change the lives of, of so many people, the responsibility uh, and the demands on your time becomes so great um, that you just, you can't help but be, you know, to make, to make those trade-offs and it becomes an ethical trade-off. It's just like, okay, do I focus on the life and this well-being of this one person Who's so important to me? Are these two people or these three people inside my home? Or do I focus on the impact um, that the work might have on alleviating the suffering of millions and millions and millions of people? Um, my know, wife has think, a sign up on her wall at our house. She has a sign with lots of different quotes. One of the quotes is, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Yeah. Whose quote is that? I like that. Uh, I, it, it, uh, on our wall, it is uncredited. <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, it's, Maybe it's, it's, it's my a, wife. She is quite very it, wise. It's 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 a fantastic quote, but it's it's a little simplistic in that that is a way to change the world, and it's very true in that you know it is the that that quote is one hundred percent true. You know that is a way to change the world, but you know like what if Martin Luther King had followed that advice? What if you know it's just like and again I, I keep wanting to emphasize that I'm not putting myself no, no. in that. We get the caveat, um, and we like that yeah, logical but argument. For the sake, but just for the sake of discussion, yes, choosing, choosing the people who got to a point where each unit of work that they did had the most leverage and the most impact on the most amount of people, and the ethical quandaries that that creates about then dividing that unit of time. You know, what if they followed that plaque on the wall and said, oh, the best thing I can do now, now that I'm in a position to change and impact and alleviate the suffering of millions of people is to go to a cabin for a month with my family and really soak in that that aspect of life. Um, it just gets difficult. It, it, there's just no correct answer. So, um, but Brandon, just taking, so let's use your own thought. I love this. Um, let's use Martin Luther King. Now, Honey, uh, you know, Humans of New York, uh, I, I don't know the latest numbers. I want to say over 30 million, uh, over a tribe of over 30 million people around the world. Um, you know, multiple times you press a button or put a link at the bottom of a post and in 24, 48, 72 hours, you know, 
five, ten million dollars are raised. Schools are changed, not just schools, people's lives are changed, entire industries. You've brought attention to the plight of uh, people sold into kind of slavery and making brick ovens in, in, in Pakistan. Could I not argue or or what is the answer or how do you think about it? Like you, you are in a relationship. You do have a kid. You're in Austin on a vacation or not vacation. You're working, but you're in Austin with your family. And you may have more kids, you know, you're pretty young. So I'm just saying like, then do you not, like, how do you, how did you wrestle through that to get to the place of having a family? And, and. Well, yeah, you know, again, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that, and this is where I've been kind of narrowing my focus. I mean, early on, I had a, a cross and a, a fork in the road, whereas in, I had two things that were, you know, getting very big uh, at the same time. First of all, my art. But then also the concept of Humans of New York, which has been replicated hundreds of times around the world and probably tens of thousands of times in advertising and, and public relations meetings around the world. Um, the, the concept of, you know, I, and I'm sure it had been done in the past, you know, nothing's truly original. But as I, I think Humans of New York was the first place where, um, you know, to achieve that kind of prominence and that kind of, you know, in, entry into the mainstream using this format of photo interview of especially of random people on the street. And so I had this concept that was replicable and has been replicable. Um, but then I also had my art, my personal photography, my personal style of writing. And the choice was... Sorry, I don't do understand I, what you mean by your art. Are you talking about you getting hired for photo shoots and stuff? No, 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 no. I mean, there, the, there's there's two different things when you look at Humans of New York. There's the idea. Uh -huh. There's the basic framework of stopping a random person on the street and learning their story. Right. And then there's Brandon Stanton's craft, which is his specific skill set developed while working in that framework of being a writer, of being a photographer, of being an interviewer. That's that's the art. That's that's my artistry. And at the very early uh, you know talking about units of work and and having to make choices yes. and having to make sacrifices, you know, I very early on I had to choose do I want to be an artist or do I want to be a philanthropist? Mm. Do I want to export this and create some sort of organization and teach other people and expand the humans of concept to try to scale and reach as many people as possible? Or do I want to be an artist and do I want to spend all day long thinking about how to tell the best story possible of the person that's in front of my face? And those things would have been mutually exclusive because to do any of them at the highest level requires all of your thought and all of your attention. And I made the decision to be an artist. And that is something that I kind of carry with me today. And that I focus on being the best storyteller that I possibly can. How, and a lot of that's just getting out of the way, uh, which is why I love Hemingway so much. It's just like, how do I, how do I take myself out of this, this, this equation? How do I maintain the person's voice? How do I, how do I disappear so that I can be a channel for their emotion and their story and their experience. Cause I think that's the most impactful way to reach other people. And so, you know, so much of my art and so much of my, or so much of the focus of my life has been on that has been on storytelling and bringing this back to family, which is where this comp started, you know, that gives me a lot of freedom because I don't have to be inside any sort of organization. I can do it anytime. You know what I mean? Yeah. I can do my art. You probably have at, very few, if any, employees. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I want to know what to do with them. People ask to work for free for me all the time. I don't know what to do with them. They want to I edit your they want to they want to help they want to edit and crop your photos. They want to respond to comments in your Instagram. They want to uh, set up your website so that you have a speaking trailer. They Look, there's lots of people like you and me who have five employees or 10 employees or 20 employees. And look at, you can ramp up to Tony Robbins with a hundred. And you and me have made the choice to be artists first and to have no employees and to be doing it ourselves. And we, we also get the, the painful sides of doing that, but we get to live the life we want. Very true. Um, because you don't have to be a manager. Um, so yeah. And you know, that inherently gives me more time with my family, um, than a Bezos or, you know, a Martin Luther King or mm, anything. Elon Musk because, or something. I mean, there's, 
I mean, 90% of the day, or, you know, maybe that's an exaggeration, but like, you know, 75% of her waking hours, my daughter's within 30 feet of me, or, you know, within, especially in this place in Austin, that's tiny, (laughs) you know, it's, it's, I do need my quiet time and I do need my space, but I'm there and I can step away and we can do something. So right now it's working right now. It's working well. And I think, I think I am doing both things, uh, in the way that I, I feel, you know, it's, it's an ethical decision. To well, me. and you I know, see it's important. It's important to me to be a good father and a good husband. I'm not, I don't want to be that story. Yeah. You know, I got very committed to not being, the the person who was too ambitious to be a good father you know i'm very committed to not being that person um and right now it's working well and you said you know um baked in there that the work or the challenge or the the place where you put energy is on maintaining that balance on 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 being a you know working at that to make sure that that works and i was thinking about benjamin franklin because you know he was kind of the king of of introspective and life, like kind of life hacking, you know, about 150 years ago. Um, and on the Tim Ferriss podcast, you said, people get stuck because they want to accomplish too big of things and they don't know the right step to take. So I always say, instead of focusing on the year or the total arc of your life, focus on the 24-hour period. And nobody mastered the 24-hour period better than Benjamin Franklin. Of course, Benjamin Franklin's famous credo was to start each day by asking, what good shall I do this day? And ending each day by asking, what good have I done this day? I looked up a Bob Dylan quote that that hearing you and ben, and Walter Isaacson reminded reminded me of, which is this quote. Um, this is Bob Dylan. And I want to be careful because I know a lot of people butcher Bob Dylan quotes. A man is a success if he gets up in the morning and gets to bed at night. And in between, he does what he wants to do. Hmm. Well, mm, that one's a little tougher because it's like, you know, I think discipline is the art of things that you might not want to do in the moment but is going to result in you doing a higher level and a higher, I mean, in the moment you might want to play video games. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But like in the moment, there's a deep level of contentment to reaching a place where you have the, the freedom and the capacity to create an impact every single day. And that takes a lot of doing what you don't want to do in the moment. Um, so, you know, that one, that one, uh, I don't know if it, if I relate to that one as, as much, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's not driven by want it's, it's driven by discipline. It's driven by routine, um, it, which became want, you know, eventually like right now, my work is just so fascinating and so fun. You know what I mean? That there's, there's very little air or gap between what I want to do every single day and what I have to do every single day. You know, um, there was a time, you know, when, uh, the uh you know for example there were like when i was reading yeah you know, the 100 pages a day it, you said eight hours sometimes because you didn't like the book but you said i do 100 pages so you had to do it, it felt like work well, to you. there were a lot of books that i called my vegetables do you know what i mean yes it's like wealth of nations was a, a very transformative book for me um one of the reasons is before that time i had the kind of uh you know, the, the teenage viewpoint that capitalism was something, you know, or the, you know, the teenage pothead viewpoint that capitalism was something inherently evil. Uh, and then to read the wealth of nations and learned that capitalism saved the world from mercantilism and the whole, it, it, it came into the world in a very beneficial way. I feel bad for saying this, but I have, like, I really have no idea what mercantilism is. Uh, you, what, did you want me to explain it? No, I just, yeah. Like what's the definition? <laughs> That word no, mean? I mean, okay, this is you got to remember. I read this when I was twenty. I'm years sorry old. to ask you. I just oh, like I'm like, commerce, what is mercantilism? Commerce, commerce was very much controlled by you know these these powerful entrenched interests, starting with the king, and any sort of economic opportunity was portioned out based on the goodwill and the favor of the king. Right, and you couldn't you couldn't break into an industry without an official charter or with a, right. you know without an official commission similar and to a, that, a monarchy or like the moguls of india or you know exactly ruler based that, yeah and what you know and what capitalism does is creates a system to where anybody through their own efforts and their own willpower can create a life and a sense of security for themselves and what happens is so much more wealth is created 
if you give freedom to the people who are able to make wealth, and that helps everybody, that helps society. So inherently, capitalism came into the world as a beautiful thing. Um, and it was only in its excesses that it became a something that needed to be regulated and something that needed to be checked. Um, and so going back to why we ha- we're talking about Wealth of Nations is that was that book was horrible to get through. I called it my, you know, I call books like that my vegetables. Like, I, they're not easy to eat. Um, well, I love vegetables today because my wife's a great cook. Um, but, you know, they they were very hard to get through. But, you know, I learned a lot from them. And so, you know, there there was, you know, a period of my life where, you know, so much of my advancement, my growth was due to discipline and not to passion. And that's what gets away from that Dylan quote. It's that like humans of New York, if you're going to ask me, was I able to succeed at what I did because I'm a passionate person or because I'm a disciplined person? Now, I am both. I have a lot of passion and I have a lot of discipline. But Humans of New York was built on discipline. It was built on me at the age of 21 deciding that I'm going to do this every single day, whether I feel like it or not, and started with reading 100 pages. And then it turned into playing piano for an hour and running and you know exercising every single day. And I, I built out from there. But it, be, it began with take, pay, um, you know, reading 100 pages a day. And then when it got to Humans of New York, it went out there and I was going to photograph every single day, no matter what, no matter how, how I felt. And for years, I was posting four times a day. I mean, it started with like 30 posts a day, but I mean, those photos were horrible. They didn't take much time to make. But then as I got better and more refined, I mean, for years, I posted four times a day without fail, you know, and that that discipline created the framework to get me out on the street every single day, not only to meet interesting people and to have these magical encounters, but also to get better. And I mean, boy, did I get better. I mean, and I'm still getting better so fast. And yeah, but your your getting better curve is not um, as as steep as it was before. And now right. to get better, you you've passed ten thousand hours. You've passed a hundred thousand hours. Now to get better, you know, even a very very minute difference in getting better today is a massive delta on what somebody else could do without the hundred thousand hours. Well, and and I mean, the amazing thing is that was it was all in public. It was all in public. Like my entire education and photography was in public. Yeah. You know, I had a million followers two years after I took my first photograph. Yeah. And a lot of the photos, but it was just like the concept was so strong that it drew people. My talent really wasn't there yet. Yeah. I was getting well, lucky. I was having these beautiful uh, encounters and these moments, but my talent as it exists today. And, you know, some people will, would argue about exactly how much talent it is. That's fine. But like it was, it was created and refined in the view of millions of people. And that involved taking risks and pushing myself to do things that I didn't think that I could do in front of millions of people, which is a very difficult thing to do. And it's why so many people stagnate. They get one thing that works and they get so addicted to that acclaim and that, you know, that, that um, recognition or, you know, the validation that comes from doing the same thing over and over again, that it doesn't grow. Um, but, you know, and that's why I think it, it, it was so important that the initial thing that I wanted to do was to be an artist and to get as good as I could at art. Because if I wanted to be an influencer, then the moment I had 10 million followers, it would have stopped. There was nowhere else to go. And it was about, you know, but because it was rooted in the art, because it was rooted in the 10,000 photos and not the 10 million fans, there was never an end. And there still isn't because there's, I'm still getting so much better every single day. And there's still so much more I can do to be able to tell as good of a story as possible. Um. Thank you for like um, 
slapping a giant thumbs up emoji on something we don't talk about enough on three books, which is this, which is discipline and how to design a system that actually enables laziness. But if you, you just have, you have to create a standard. I mean, June 20th, 2008, Brandon, not, not too long before Honey launched, you know, I, my wife told me she wasn't in love with me anymore and she wanted a divorce right around the same time my friend was in a serious mental state after attempting suicide. And he, you know, he called me from the hospital and told me, um, you know, uh, that he was frozen on a beach in his underwear after trying to poison himself with carbon monoxide in a garage in Cape Cod. And like I had, I was talking to him every day from the hospital and I started a blog called 1000awesomethings.com. And do you think I felt awesome? No, but because mm -hmm. I started the post with one number 1000, I typed in how to start a blog on WordPress. I clicked the mm -hmm. button. I don't know anything about blogs. 1000awesomethings.wordpress.com. Number 1000, the post sucked. A broccoli flower, nature's ugliest vegetable, blah, blah, blah. Hit awesome. Yeah. I, I said at 12.01 a.m. every single night for a thousand straight days, I'm going to do this to cheer myself mm -hmm. up. And yeah. next day, 999, 998. No one read the site. It sucked. It was a terrible blog. No one should. But then when 50,000 people came a few months later, I got to, I got to, I was like, but it's just the discipline. You want to look, Todd Hansen, the, one of the editors of The Onion was asked how to get paid to write comedy. And his answer is do it for free for 10 years. Hmm. Yeah, it's great. Do it for free for 10 years, like put in the chops, the time, the discipline, learn in public, train with millions of eyes on you. And your creation is not about uh, New York anymore <laughs> to use just one, just one lens that's kind of cast off of it. You're still evolving as an artist and doing so in public. And I love, like, I just, I just love that you kind of called out that the, it's the discipline that's driving it, even though the artist is the, the center of it. And still, you know, still today, it's like, and that's why, you know, I was just joking with my brother yesterday. He took a few days off running. Um, and uh, we were running together uh, when I visited him in Atlanta. And, you know, it's again, it's just, it's not about any specific, it's not about the consequence of missing any single day. Yeah. It's about losing the routine. And, like, and, anyway. and, the art, like the art, like be, making the choice to be an artist first and how that art comes through the routine or the routine enables the art um, is a perfect tie in, Brandon, to your next book, which is just kids. Can I go here or do you want me to go to the other book? Oh, you go. I, I, you okay, go I was like, I'm going want. here. I, I was like, I, I wanted to go here. Yeah. But but then I was like, oh, shit. I wonder if he read the anyway, whatever. We'll go just kids by Patty Smith. This book was published in 2010 by Harper Collins it is a black, shiny paperback with a blurry selfie of a very young Patty Smith and Robert Maplethorpe on the cover. A gold national book award is stamped. The inside jacket um, paints a portrait. Um, Joan Didion uh, has, has said a quote, this book is so honest and pure as to count as true rapture. It was the summer Coltrane died, the summer of love and riots, and the summer when a chance encounter in Brooklyn led two young people on a path of art, devotion, and initiation. Patti Smith would, would evolve as a poet and performer, and Robert Maplethorpe would direct his highly provocative style toward photography. Bound in innocence and enthusiasm, they traversed the city from Coney Island to 42nd Street, and it doesn't mention, also homeless for quite a while. And in 1969, the pair set up camp at the infamous Hotel Chelsea. It was a time of heightened awareness when the worlds of poetry, rock and roll, art, and sexual politics were colliding and exploding. In this milieu fueled by their mutual dreams and drives, they would prod and provide for one another during the hungry years. Just Kids begins as a love story and ends as an elegy. It serves as a salute to New York City during the late 60s and 70s and to its rich and poor, its hustlers and hellions. A true fable, it is a portrait of two young artists, a scent and a prelude to their fame. Brandon, tell us about your relationship with Just Kids by Patti Smith. Um, yeah, so this is a little different than along the lines of, of what we've been talking, which is about kind of self-development. Um, you know, this, this book, which I think is probably, you know, a category of book that everybody has, was, the, you know, the friend when you needed it. Um, the person who went through something similar to you. Uh, at the time that you were going through it and felt that you might be the only one going through it. 
Um, there's a, you know, period in New York, uh, where I'd moved to New York with nothing, you know, but two suitcases and I had no photography experience. And you know, I was living in a, a bad situation in Bedford Stuyvesant that I found on Craigslist. And, um, I was not eating enough. I, yeah, it was bad. Um, and you said you were eating peanut butter and jam sandwiches every day, yeah, using welfare yeah. checks to pay for your rent and, you know, wear the same clothes every day, wear the same shoes every day. Right. And, um, you know, this is, there's, there is, you know, in, in all the discipline and, you know, everything, there's another aspect to it, you know, of, you know, you've gotta, you've gotta be able to dream and you've gotta really have faith in your dream. And, you know, I was a big daydreamer. I would, yeah, I would take long walks at night. Uh, I had nothing else to do. I didn't even know anybody in New York. I still do that. It's a good thing. What? I still do three hour late night walks by myself. Oh, yeah. It's a good thing. I, you know, I love them. I, you know, I don't, I just, it's just, there's, there's so many things that I wish I could do that I don't do anymore just because I don't have the time. Uh, I don't read as much anymore as I could just because I'm writing too much. Like, but anyways, um, so I take these long walks every single night and, you know, I kind of envision what humans of New York could become again, not being able nearly to envision what it did become. I remember telling my friend, you know, like, there was a time when I was getting like 10 new Facebook fans a day or something. And I told my friend, I was like, I remember this very clearly. We were in Central Park. It was the night of the supermoon. And uh, I told him, man, if I keep doing this for three years, I'm going to have 10,000 Facebook fans. And just thinking that that was the biggest number I could possibly imagine. 10,000 people looking at my work. Every I'm, day. I'm like, laughing because I can relate. I said that to my friend Fred when we, I was starting my blog. I was like, I just want to have 50,000 hits. I said that exact yeah, sentence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there is that, that big dreaming and, and picturing and imagining, you know, that, that, that's also a big part of, you know, fending off. There's, you know, there's that very logic driven self-improvement discipline side of it but you know there's a, the also you know the emotional side of it and the you know the fighting the doubt and fighting the loneliness and you know a big part of that is uh you know it's kind of dreaming and uh and you know uh yeah yeah can, can so, i read uh, you can i read you a quote from the book yeah go ahead um, page 195, uh, Patty Smith is talking about Robert's focus on his art and how he'd be all consuming with it. She says, or she writes, Robert on a roll was like David Hemmings in blow up the obsessive concentration images tacked on a wall, a cat detective stalking the terrain of his own work, the trail of blood, his footprint, his mark, even Hemmings words from the film seemed to subtext Robert's private mantra, colon, I wish I had tons of money then I'd be free. Free to do what? Everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's it. You know, there's just these, th that book is about two souls who, you know, came to New York with nothing, you know, hoping for everything. And, uh, yeah, you know, and to, to kind of commune with somebody, you know, especially, I mean, Patty, it just she nailed that narrative it was just so beautiful and uh, but on that question and, of freedom like you know if you have money you can do whatever you want you know that's that's the point you've heard you say in the past i'm going to paraphrase you saying all i want to do was do whatever i want like we just take pictures all day and then to come up with a lifestyle that affords me the ability to do that and so i want to kind of ask you about your definition of freedom it's kind of related to what we were talking about but then also you're saying and i just heard you say you know like i wish i had more time to read i wish i had more time to go for long walks i wish you know and and, and not to say that's not just part of the human condition and maybe we all feel that way but like don't you have like couldn't you not do what you want to do like isn't that not what you've got yourself to it gets to a point at a certain level of success that it takes time to manage the success itself you know i've got hundreds of thousands of copies of a book that's about to ship out you know i need to have weekly zoom meetings with my publisher to make sure that their investment in me is you know that is good for them and that you know I, they have everything that they need to do their job well um and you know there's just a lot of of planning that goes into launching a project that big 
Um, so, you know, just there's, it, it gets to a point where getting what you want, um, it, it creates additional work in order to maintain it. Um, not necessarily just the passion driven pen to a notebook, scribbling at 3 a.m. with your head full of ideas. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful type of work and type of obligation to have, but, you know, it's also an obligation. Um, so, you know, you're, you're the uh, attaining your success will, will constrain your freedom in ways, um, that, uh, you know, you're never, you're never just going to be able to, uh, just completely follow your whimsy all day long. I, I, I totally hear what you're saying. Um, Ah, and sometimes, you know, I may be pining for like a black and white answer where just simply none exists. I wonder if, if I could read you another, I, I wonder if I could read you another quote from the book. It's on page 220. Um, this is Patty uh, in her beautiful prose, as you mentioned. She says, um, and she's talking about uh, weed or cannabis. <clears throat> she says, I kept my pot smoking to myself, listening to Screaming Target, writing impossible prose, I never thought of pot as a social drug. I like to use it to work, to think, and eventually for improvising. And I've heard you speak positively and negatively about pot in many interviews. You talk about the daydreaming and the sort of flunking out of school aspect of pot. And I think um, you talk about mushrooms. But then I also heard you on other interviews, in including the one today, uh, where you say, hey, you know, maybe because of that, I, I sort of envisioned bigger things, right? Like I, I was daydreaming about what I wanted. And so hearing Patty Smith write so openly and transparently about a drug that has been illegal for so long and is now legal in a lot of places, including where I live, I, I felt that very inspiring. And so I was just curious um, if you credit cannabis at all with, with kind of any of insights you've had, but also if you have a relationship with it and and if you think that it imbues creativity or if you think it, it, it's something that like, I just think there's a lot of people out there, you know, it's like, how do we lean into this? You know, Paul McCartney famously admitted that the song got to get you into my life was actually about cannabis, not about a person. Uh, what's your relationship there? And could you tell us about it? Right. Um, well, you know, it's, it's hard to, from the age of 18 or even earlier than that, from 17 to 21 to determine what of what of my perception at that age was due to pot because I was smoking all the time. I was just smoking ridiculous morning, noon, and night. All what now? Like chronic morning, noon, and night. Yeah, uh, I was smoking a lot. Um, and so, what happened is pot became a part of my life. Once I got my discipline and my routine down, it became part of my discipline and part of my routine. Um, for several years, I would take a single hit every single night, uh, normally right before I played piano. Um, and I would play for an hour. Um, or I would take a single hit for several years and take a long walk and think about my work. Um, so it went from being <clears throat> it went from being an escape to a t and to being a tool, and I think whether or not it's an escape or a tool dictates on whether it's a positive or a benefit or to or a positive or a detriment to your life. Um, if you are using it <clears throat> for the sensation, just to feel good and just to feel content and just to not worry about things. Um, then chances are it's it's having a numbing and a doling effect um, that, you know, whereas in you could be, I, I think South Park said it best, the problem with marijuana is it makes you okay with doing nothing. It makes you okay with being bored. Um, and there's a lot of truth to that. And in time, you could be using to improve yourself, um, to have an impact on people, to alleviate suffering in the world. Uh, instead, you're content with doing nothing because you're high. Um, but it also, <clears throat> what it does for me, and I just smoked last night. Um, I hadn't smoked for a couple of weeks because I'd been, um, kind of focusing on my writing. Um, and you know, sometimes, uh, I, I think there's a little bit, I, I do notice a little bit of an edge I lose, uh, in my energy and my, in my focus, uh, not much at all, uh, but a little bit. Um, and so I'll sometimes, you know, if I really have a project that I need to finish and I'm working really hard on something, I'll take a couple weeks off. 
Uh, but you know, I just smoked last night. Um, I took one hit. That's all I ever take. And, uh, you know, I took a long walk and, and, and what it's, where it's good for me is it, it gets me perspective. It gets me away from this other aspect we've been talking about of breaking the work up into units and, um, into routine. Whereas in you're always focusing on the thing that's right in front of your face. Um, you know, what, what marijuana does is it kind of activates that that part of your brain that's more imaginative and more playful and more adventurous and your mind wanders a lot more and it's when your mind wanders a lot more that you kind of stumble upon ideas um, and you kind of stumble upon inspiration and it and it also kind of backs me up and gives me a much broader perspective of things where I'll focus on the la- or I'll reflect on the last 10 years and ev- everything that's happened or I'll reflect on the next 10 years. Uh, and I'll kind of look at things big picture in a way that I don't when I'm grinding every single day. And so that's how I kind of use it as a tool. And, you know, I think it's, it's not, I don't think everybody needs it. You know, I think that all of these things I mentioned can be attained without taking a hit of marijuana. Um, but you know, I, I found that it, it helps put me in a good mindset um, to do creative thinking and a lot of my, you know, great ideas, uh, for projects I wanted to do that ended up being extremely successful, uh, occurred to me when I was taking a three mile walk after taking a hit. Um, so that's my, that's my current relationship with marijuana. Yeah. Um, my current relationship is identical. Like I, (laughs) I, I, I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm sort of gobsmacked at the similarity. Uh, I don't talk about it much. I, 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 I find it, I find that I'm self judgmental about it because I grew up in an era or age uh, where it was illegal. It was doing drugs. It was, mm-hmm. you know, you bought a, a little do- a bag from the back of a dumpster. And I would, and, and by the way, like I didn't start till I was in my mid twenties. And so I didn't, I was not exposed to that, but I saw the PSAs with the with the puppets with the fried eyeballs, and I was like, yeah, like you know, if I if I try this, then I'm gonna hit Skid Row in about probably twelve to twenty four hours, mm-hmm. you know, and and so I'm trying. What I'm wondering is if you can go on the record, and if I can go on the record, and if you you know, and we can talk about this, then it it opens up a dialogue that I think is I feel is kind of kind of missing right now. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, but I also, at the same time, I mean, marijuana was, I was, there's something to those PSAs. I mean, marijuana, I mean, it, it was almost a bad thing in my life. You know and I, I mean? It was almost, it's like, it's all about your, you know, just because a lot of people enjoy a single glass of wine every single night but in, and it's a benefit to their lives doesn't mean that alcohol is a detriment to society. Do you know what I mean? Oh, uh, sorry. Um, it doesn't mean alcohol is a benefit to society, right? Yeah. Or it's, well, it doesn't mean, yes, yes, yes. There you go. Sorry. Um, and it, it's just, and, and it's the same thing. And I think marijuana is much more benign than alcohol, but I do know friends of mine who could have done a lot more. I think it, they if they didn't lean on weed so heavily um to be happy it's, a, it's be- a less common overlap to have the weed smoker and the high achiever than the weed smoker and the low or the lack of hitting your full potential achievers right. well and i think what's necessary is a fear of it and i i tried to define what separates the people who continue to smoke and went on the great things and and the people who you know continue to smoke and just kind of drifted um and i think it's it's always i always had a fear of it and i've always had a fear of drugs in general and i think that's important i think that's very important is that you always need to have this fear of what the substance can become if it gets power over you and that fear helps you you know, it gives you a sensitivity to when you're traveling down that path in a way that you can reel it back in. Would it be fair to say that you're pro-legalization, though, given that you say it's more benign than alcohol? Alcohol, of course, is very 
you know, like, so that you're kind of on that side of the fence, though. You're sort of, if I'm hearing you right, you're saying not good for society as a whole necessarily. Definitely can o- o- OD on it, and certainly wouldn't want to recommend it. Especially not health, having a healthy fear is good. At the same time, well, you're you're also pretty be, progressive on it. You're like, they, well, when there's a person that, for, and, and I would actually, I would back off. I I I would say marijuana would be a net positive to society. Um, I I would actually put it in that category. I think it's that different from alcohol. Um, you know, in that, and you know, I think it makes people more empathetic. I think it helps people imagine what it's like to be other people more. There's so many, you know, I, I would say that it would be a net positive. So I wouldn't even go, go that far to put it in that same bucket as, as alcohol. Um, but it's just, you know, there are dangers to it. Um, you know, especially when people are kind of young, um, and, you know, don't really have the worldview to be able to compartmentalize it or categorize it. Um, but yes, no, I would say that I'm definitely in favor of um, legalization. Great. Uh, thank you. And thanks for letting me open that up. I appreciate it. And it's really interesting to hear a similar uh, artistic process. Um, um, I, I wrote about uh, that for me in a, in a, in a, a memoir that was released on audio only. Um and it was the first time I put it out there and I had uh, feedback that was both positive and negative. But because oh. it was an audio only memoir, um, I was able to take some liber- like I was experimenting a little bit with how it felt. So, you know. Huh. Yeah. You know, and it's just like the it's it's one of the having the I mean, one of the few industries where talking about it doesn't have a negative effect on my career. You know what I mean? I take yeah. pictures. So it's just like, I think me and you have the freedom to kind of riff on, riff on it in ways that if, you know, we had a, uh, a boss, you know, uh, but I mean, I think another thing that, that is important to say is that like, when I meet somebody who, um, has never smoked marijuana, I do not encourage them to smoke marijuana. I do not, I'm not somebody's like, Oh, it's going to change your life. It's going to make you this, make you that. If you've gotten to your, you, if you have gotten to the place where you are productive and you are happy and you are content without the aid of any substances at all, I think that's a great way to be. Uh, and I, you know, I I would not try to talk somebody that you know that has achieved that um, into you know that they're missing something. I think that I totally hear you. And I think that that if caveat is a really important one, the if, you know, because, you know, if I think about myself in those conversations with friends or family, it's like, it's usually in a place where someone might be saying that they're having trouble or challenge or stuck or, you know what I mean? So then you, then you open the conversation. But if, yeah, you're saying, hey, you're putting on a pedestal, even though you say marijuana is not positive for society, you're putting on a pedestal that, that on, on like, the person who gets there, whatever, however they define there, without the aid of any substances, is right. is is on a higher pedestal than those who get there with some help, as they define it. And it's just like addiction is such a demon, and it's such a beast, and it and it and it. You don't even know when you're addicted. A lot of times, you're. I mean, we're all addicted to our phones, and we don't even realize it. We'll realize it more in ten years when the science comes out. But like the, I agree with um, you a hundred percent. Yeah, and it's just like you know, it's you don't. If somebody, it, it's if you have managed to. A lot of us are addicted more, to coffee. A lot of us are addicted to caffeine. A lot of us are addicted to. Uh, sugar. A lot of us are addicted to, you know, uh, the dopamine that we get off of likes. A lot of us are addicted. Like, there's crazy addiction in the world right now. Right. Pornography which addiction. Why, which is why that just because I've figured out the discipline to compartmentalize a substance, I don't want to go up to somebody else and say, hey, go play around with it. It'll be great. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because you just you never know what's wrapped up in that person's DNA that might take them down a different path than you, which is always when I find somebody who, you know, doesn't smoke and doesn't feel the need to, I'm not trying to evangelize. Beautiful. Thank you. I love it. I appreciate the rant and I love the way your mind naturally oscillates like a pendulum because to me, what I hear as I listen to you is no wonder the pictures are so good. No wonder the story's awesome. Like you paint the portrait of every side of every, it's beautiful. And someone else who is masterful at doing this is a fellow by the name of Robert A. 
Caro. He is the author of your third and final book, The Great. Power Broker. I'm so glad that I got to be the one. Did nobody choose the Lyndon Johnson books either? Not this yet. Guy. Not yet. We've had some yeah, candidates for those is, ones. This guy is one of the greatest living writers in the world. I, I can't believe that I'm the one that got to choose it. Well, don't forget, Brandon, we're doing a thousand formative books. That's only a thousand. And I'm only in year two of it. Okay. So okay. I'm I'm on, Still, we've done I'm, about 120 I'm, I'm, books so far. I can't believe you got through 30 people without, uh, without Caro coming. He's, he is the tight, he's a titan. He's a titan, Neil. You you think that when I call up, uh, just so I'm just so I'm clear, I'm I'm laughing, uh, and I don't know if you can hear, I, I don't know if you can see my smile, but you okay. think uh, that when I ring up Judy Bloom or uh, David Sedaris or uh, you know a former sex worker in Omaha, Nebraska, or the world's greatest Uber driver, that they're gonna drop this thirteen hundred page <laughs> brick? This thing, man, I'm holding this thing. I'm worried I might hurt my, like, this thing is a brick, man. It, it says the power broker in big red font, all caps. It screams that you do not read because you cannot even lift it. It has, you know, those little photo inserts in the middle of a book. It has three of them. It does that three times. It's so book. And the only reason it's this quote unquote short is because Robert Carroll was told nobody will read your, your 2000 page book. So he was forced in another year after years of working on this book to spend a whole like other year just trying to get it down to 1300 pages yes indeed it is robert moses and the fall of new york winner of the pulitzer prize published in 1973 this is as brandon's hinting at the definitive biography even when you open the page the word the power broker spread across multiple pages it is a sprawling tale of the quote-unquote community organizer urban planner of new york Robert Moses, it completely changed his reputation. People had regarded him for decades as, uh, you know, a sort of a, a benevolent uh, kind of community gatherer. And this book completely added color, depth, and illumination to the natures of his power. A sample quote from the book to give people an example of what we're talking about is this quote from uh, Robert Moses, where he says, uh, if the ends do not justify the means, what does? Um, Brandon Stanton, tell us about your relationship with The Power Broker by Robert A. Caro. I, I, and I have not yet made it through this one, listeners. Oh, as I have. my God, I stumped you. I stumped you. Um, the, uh, well, this is where you also, um, <clears throat> I guess we have to introduce another aspect of my personality, which we haven't discuss which is i'm a history major um lo love history um and that is one of the heartbreaking things that kind of had to fall to the wayside uh when i was doing humans of new york just because only so much time in the day um but you know history and biography was 80 percent of my first few years of reading um and this guy's the best at it i mean that is got to be in the discussion of one of the Great when you're picking the one of the greatest nonfiction books of all time is Lyndon Johnson series. Again, that's you think the power broker is intimidating. Imagine four of those stacked on top of each other. That's his Lyndon Johnson series. I think he's working on the fifth one, or maybe I got my numbers wrong. But um he is well, first of all, he's 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 fantastic with narrative. Um he you know, he can he can he can find the themes and the struggles and the arcs of these real people's lives and deduce this massive amount of research and information into these narrative structures that are just very captivating um, and an epic and, you know, almost mythic in a way, um, while at the same time getting everything right, getting all the facts right and elucidating he's famous um, for his record keeping his uh oh, hundreds oh, yeah. if not thousands just, of I interviews just, yeah i just read his book on working um where he kind of talks about his process um but i mean where what he is the best at of, of anyone in the world i mean where where he is th this man is is the world's foremost expert on power and the specifically the application of power in a modern democracy. And that is primarily the theme that runs through both the power broker and the Lyndon Johnson novels. And I mean, not novels, how, right? 
the what now? they're not novels, right? The biographies. Well, I, I mean, I yeah. call them novels, whatever. Okay. <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah. epic tomes. Yeah, but That's nonfiction. I wanted to say. Yeah, but they read like novels, so I mean, oh, maybe that, interesting. That's why, that's my tongue is slipping so much here. Well, well, and this is something about humans of New York. It's nonfiction that reads like novel. There you go, and it's probably why I'm so attached to this man because he, you know, he he's the best at it. Um, and you know the so his the specific the specific uh, you know jewel or treasure in each of these books is how well he depicts how power operates in a modern democracy and what more valuable you know thing to know and understand as a citizen of a democracy uh than where power really resides uh and you know the power broker is so great because as all great works of nonfiction you know the he he basically, you know, gives this education by focusing on the life and the experiences of a single individual, which was Robert Moses, who came up, um, I think it was the head of the Transportation Authority or something in New York City, um, but managed to build a, a base and an empire to where he was in power for 30 years and more powerful than the governors and the mayors. He outlasted so many elected officials who had to come to him asking for money uh, because of the way, because of his knowledge and his understanding of how power operates. Um, he became the most powerful man in the city and he was never elected. And the power broker is the story of how he accomplished that. And in learning that story, you learn so much about how a modern city operates. And by proxy, as that's a microcosm of how power operates more generally in a democracy. And so much so, you know, what I'm saying is so true that Barack Obama himself draped a shiny piece of metal around this man's neck, saying that. Everything he learned about modern politics, he learned from the power broker. And what you're saying is so true that even a longtime kind of opponent of Robert Moses, Jane Jacobs, whose book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, was just added to our top 1000 only a few chapters ago in chapter 59 by Jeff Speck. She herself is quoted uh, right in the book. I'm on page two. She says, apart from the books being so good as biography, as city history, as sheer good reading, that power broker is an immense public service. Yes. And yes. I think that's kind of what you're saying too. Right. It's just like the, I mean, how it all works. Exactly. Um, and it's, of course, which makes it so fascinating, not the way you think it works. You know, the, <laughs> yeah. the power is not where you think it is. You know, why, why did the governor of New York have to drive to Robert Moses's office to ask for favors? Why did he have to go there? Why? You know, what is, I mean, do you want me to get into the intricacies of writing city legislation and creating a, a system where toll revenue went into the pocket of Robert Moses instead of in the pockets of the city coffers? And therefore, in order to spend money and create new projects, Governors in in order to get votes, governors and mayors had to go ask Robert Moses for permission to build bridges and to build highways, which would make them look good, which would get them reelected, which gave him an immense amount of power over the operations of the city. Robert uh, Caro writes uh, about why he got interested in this guy uh, was because he went through democracy as he thought it worked as a person like actually trying to get like oppose a bridge and get the petition and everyone in the neighborhood agreed and you know the town councilor mm -hmm. is on the same and then like they built the bridge and he's like why did they build we everything was lined up against it and then he looked into it and he's like some guy named robert moses said to build it he's like but who is and then he's like that guy isn't even elected like no one even votes for him he's like if i don't and he said like, apparently the 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 uh, uh anecdote i don't i won't want to say it's a fact is that like he was driving home and he said if i don't understand how this guy works and why he gets power and why he can just ch ride over the whole thing then then i don't know how democracy works right. you know i don't know how the whole system works i don't know how life works right um so yeah he set out to do it uh and i think it took him 10 years but he finally figured it out um you really I mean, don't want someone caring that kind of a grudge against you in life <laughs> 
<laughs> spend 10 yeah, years exactly. analyzing your life, talking to every single person you've ever met and oh, known. I know, I know. I mean, I don't, I do not have the abilities um, or the patience or the dedication to, uh, to be a biographer or, you know, or a historian like he, it just takes, it takes too much commitment. Um, I'm much more suited to the humans of New York style of a new person every single day, a new story every single day. Um, the, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it was very inspiring to me. I've read the book twice and I've read all his uh, four volumes of Lyndon Johnson twice. Wow. Uh, and I actually ran into him on the street. Who? Uh, I think I f***ed him out. Caro. Okay. Uh, not, not Moses. <laughs> yeah, no, not Lyndon Johnson or Robert Moses. Uh, I, you know, I ran into him on the street by Central Park. I was just like, I was starstruck. I was starstruck. I was just like... Oh man, you are because I didn't expect to see him, and I look trying to think of what to say, and I'm, all I can say is, "You are such a great man. <laughs> you are such a great man." And then he's like, "Oh, thank you." And then of course I pivoted to the uh, the, the cringy thing. Um, is there any way I could get a cup of coffee? And uh, you know, and then, and then once that came out of my mouth, he was heading for the exit. So you, you, uh, this is pre honey. You didn't. You didn't. There's no way you could say uh, like. He didn't know who I was, and I doubt he would have heard of Humans of New York. I mean. I mean, no, no, I didn't mean to that. drop the name. I mean to get him on on your blog. Like, to, oh no, I didn't have my camera with me, or maybe I did, and I was just too, I was just too, uh, you know, too excited. Even to Brandon Sand can be, can be, can can slip. Even him, he can well, slip. And the, I mean, he is. When you learn about his process and how much work and dedication it takes, you don't, you don't want to knock him off his track. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just like you, you want to res- respect his time. Uh, <laughs> My only yeah. goal was to move out of his way. Yeah, no, but I, I, yeah, I got to, I got to meet him on the street, and I was very excited to, to my detriment. I was too, I was too, too excited to come off uh, very well. Uh, but I, I got across that he was a great man, and I stand by that. One thing, and, and even though it was only one instance, right? Like he might, uh, uh, if you had another instance three months later, we don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. Well, no, he was perfectly lovely. He was he was perfectly lovely. I'm saying he um, could be I, a huge dick. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm just well, kidding. Well, would, to your Obama still, story I, earlier, I, I'm just joking. I would, still, I would forgive him I, if that if that's the, if that's the price of writing. Uh, you know. 13,000 pages. If it takes being a dick to write 13,000 pages like that uh, and have them be that good, I'll forgive him because because of the public service. Morality really jumps out in this book. I mean, just to say it again, Robert Moses, before this book was published in 1973, was regarded publicly, broadly, widely as a hero. And although he at times had squashed many other biographies, um, and he tried to squash this one. He eventually realized it was going to happen. So he sat down for an interview. Robert Caro says that the interview with Robert Moses for this book was actually a soliloquy. Like it was not an interview. It was like him just going on a rant like all day for a couple of days. And then at the mm-hmm. end, when he started asking him questions, because some of that stuff didn't jive with the other interviews he'd done, the, the, not only did Caro end the interview and and sort of walk out, he also banned anyone that worked with him to ever talk to Robert Caro. So Robert Caro right. says, the two weeks or whatever that I had where he lifted the veil, I talked to everyone else, you know, that knows this guy at that because he let me. But like the morality really, really strikes me because then the book comes out, his reputation is quite heavily tarnished, I would say, um, you know, and, and it really changed the view of him. I was like, man, Brandon has done over 10,000 interviews with people in – Dozens and dozens of countries, uh, you know, in the new book, Humans, it's just so beautiful, man. It's just incredible. I loved it. And um, I'm just like, but I wonder how he personally, you know, like Heisenberg uncertainty principle or whatever. It's like, how, I wonder how he personally has changed from a morality standpoint through the project, meaning that you've touched so many souls. You photographed the depths of them. You, you've seen around the world. I, I sense a very sort of human rights streak in you but what else like did you come into this as a as a as a vegan and shift to a meat eater <laughs> i'm I, like what about you has shifted now because of this morality wise um a similar question to asking what what about my younger self 
in like my late teens and early 20s was because of marijuana. And it's hard to tell because the marijuana was so pervasive. It's hard to tell what was the course of normal aging and other activities and what was the course of, you know, what was affected by marijuana. Uh, Humans of New York has, in large ways, been my entire existence the past 10 years. Uh, it's all I do. It's my hobby. It's my work. It's my passion. You know, other other than hanging out with my wife and my kids and my dog, my kids, my kid. Uh, I guess I refer to my dogs and my kids. Um, I do Humans of New York. That's all I do. You don't have a and- vibrant, gigantic all fulfilling social life. You aren't sitting on a ton of different no, corporate boards. No, you aren't no, managing have, people. Uh, no, none of that. You know, I have a few old friends from high school that I see every once in a while. Uh, not as much as I'd like, um, you know, but it's, it's like, yeah, you know, I'll go to the Russian Turkish baths when they were open. Uh, I did that. Uh, maybe I shouldn't blow up my spot. Um, but I, uh, you know, I would do that in New York. Um, but you know, it's, my life's very simple because what what I do to make my living and sustain myself also happens to be the thing that I would choose to do if I had any an unlimited amount of options. Um, Sorry to be- interject because I want to get right back on. I know we're going a later deeper. Can you tell me about this love of Russian Turkish baths for a quick second? Oh, no, no, no. I don't want to blow up my spot. I don't want to blow up no, my spot. Don't forget your spot. <laughs> forget. Like, because in my, Toronto, we have my, them. It's like you go in, it's a bunch of guys, you take your clothes off and you sit in a giant steam room. Is that what we're talking uh, about? Yeah, well, you don't take all your clothes off, and it's co-ed. Um, I'm a, uh, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the sauna. Uh, it's extremely relaxing. It's, it's a huge part of my routine. Uh, Sorry to pull you I, off. Go back. Yeah, I haven't been able to do it recently, but yes, I, I love it. Um, so, and yeah, I don't, I don't know where, <laughs> where I was going. Now we started talking about the bass, and I've completely forgot what the, uh, where we were going. Um, well, 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 I was asking, you were saying that similar to the marijuana lens, potentially coloring in, you know, your normal, oh, you, yes. so what you were saying changed? similarly, honey has taken up 10 years of your life. It's all you've seen. Yeah. So you can't compare your morality before and after. Having said that, I think you were still going to offer me some nug, a couple nuggets. Well, I mean, look, I've talked to 10,000 people and it, again, it's just the, I mean, if there's one thing that you kind of put your finger on, it's the, you know, swinging through you know, the pendulum of, of knowing that life is a bunch of competing perspectives based on very unique experiences and trying to figure out who is correct and who is right is a lot of times, you know, a, a, a foolish venture uh, as opposed to understanding where somebody's coming from uh, can be a lot more fruitful. Um, so, you know, you can't talk in a deep way with 10,000 people, you know, you can't even really call them talks or conversations. You know, they're very kind of forensic interviews that almost border on therapy sessions. A lot of times talking about the underlying motivations and the kind of unexamined perspectives and under unexamined thoughts that might accompany a person's story and really pushing them to reflect and to expand and to dig deeper. So, you know, a lot of times they're very, you know, intense interactions. Uh, and you can't do that 10,000 times without, you know, really opening your eyes to the, the variety of experiences that people have and how much people have suffered and how much people have struggled. And, um, you know, when, and when you're, when you're kind of in touch with all the suffering, uh, what is it? Oh, I heard a great quote, Brian Stevenson recently. Um, if you're, I'm going to butcher it. But he said, if you're willing to get close to people who are suffering, you will find the power to change the world. Um, I love that quote. God, I love that quote. Uh, if you, you know, are willing you, to you, get closer to people who are suffering, if, if I'll say this again, if you are willing right. to get closer to people who are suffering. It's not closer. I think it's close. If you're willing to get close to people who are suffering. You will find the power to change the you world. You will find the power um, to change the world by Brian yeah. Stevenson. Yeah. That'll be and in the show some... notes. We add everything in the show notes, but I just ca- shouted it out because you wanted to underline it here. You love yeah. that quote so much. What now? You said, I love that quote so much. Yeah, because it, it really, it really, you know, it kind of gave me another lens to view, you know, what the the power of, of these interactions that I've been having with people. Cause that's really, I mean, you, you see, I don't even say the power of the work because really the heart of it is, is on the street. It's not, you know, it's, it's not the heart of it. Isn't the, the captions that I post to get millions of likes. 
you know, the heart of it is what those are trying to replicate. What those, if anything, those are, those are my attempts to mimic and recreate the impact of an experience that I had, which is the experience of sitting at somebody's feet and really digging into their past and their life and their suffering and their pain getting close to that suffering. That's what Stevenson was talking about, getting in the proximity of other people's pain and other people's suffering. And that's a very spiritual experience. Talk about getting out of your own head. Talk about being present. It's my form of meditation where which you're, when you're at the foot, when you're at somebody's feet and you're at the proximity of their suffering and their struggles and their pain, you're listening to it and you're focusing on it. You cannot think about yourself. It's not possible to think about yourself when, when you are, when you are communing with somebody and you're feeling their pain. Um, and you know, it's the, you know, the question being doing that over and over and over and over again for 10 years, you know, what, what has that changed about me? I mean, do I still have these knee-jerk judgments and knee-jerk reactions? You know, it's like, you know, you've never arrived. You never arrived at morality. That's not something that happens. You never arrive at being an ethical person. You get better at moderating and you get better at balancing and you get better at pushing a back against inherent base natures that we have. Um, and so, the, you know, those are always present. The, the, the instinct to judge and to categorize, I mean, that's a self-preservation instinct of, of this person's bad, this person's a threat to me, this person's an other, this is an other right here. Uh, and so I, I, need to, I need to protect myself. You know, those are the base animalistic instincts. And then what happens is through the proximity to other people's suffering and the proximity to other people's stories, um, you, you, you realize, you know, how much of what is different about them, um, or what is unattractive about them or, or revolting about them comes from pain and suffering and some sort of, of, uh, deep experience that they had. And, you know, seeing that over and over and over and over and over again, it gives you the ammunition. It gives you more ammunition to push back against those basic instincts and, and moderate those basic instincts. And if that's becoming a more moral person, if that's becoming a better person, you know, it, 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 I, don't, I, I hesitate to ever say, you know, you're a good person or you've become a good person. Um, but, you know, it's, it's being in the proximity to, the deep personal lives of other people definitely gives you more weight within which to lean into being a good person. Oh man, I want to, I'm going to listen to you say that like seven times because it was so profound and I relate to that so much. I I have this deep philosophy inside myself and I, I can't prove it. I can't, I can't prove it at all, but I just have this feeling me personally that our species like evolved trust. Like I just, that word is such an important word in my life. I'm working on writing around it. And I feel like that trust is what enabled our society to, to thrive and what enabled our species to thrive and what enabled us to, to, you know, kill animals that were way bigger and stronger than us and take over this whole planet. And like, it's the trust. It's the idea that we are all connected, that if if I'm sick, you'll help me. And if you're sick, I'll help you. And if, you know, if, if, and we work together, then that's something that most animals don't do very well. And we did it and we figured it out. And, and I feel like today in this world, partially due to the internet, um, our tribe or our brains are trying to use our animalistic primal tendencies to map our tribal desires for trust. And so, you know, the cool kid in the uh, locker room is actually, uh, you know, Elon Musk. And the bully at the high school is Donald Trump. And the, you know, my friends are Jennifer Aniston and Justin Bieber, because I see them and their lives and their kids more on on Instagram than my own cousin. And so we've mapped this thing. And unfortunately, when society gets this big, my issue or worry or thinking is that what happens is trust starts to fracture because it's very ripe for bad actors. Is there, there's a reason why you get more spam now than ever before, or why you're, there's more phishing schemes, there's more scams, there's more people falling for bad news and, and like new media outlets that are, that are totally motivated by eyeball stickiness and, and not about objective reality. And, 
And I feel like that lessening of, tr of trust is what I want to focus some of my life on and what I think about. And so what you just said, Brandon, parlays perfectly <laughs> into something I was thinking about. And, and not to say that your thought and my thought are the same thoughts, but I just feel a connective tissue in there. And I don't know if you have a, 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 some thoughts on trust or you resonate with anything I'm, th I'm saying, but I'd love to explore that a little bit with you. And and I, you know, if you, if you can well, go I mean, there. I haven't thought about it much, so I don't have much to add, but it sounds, I mean, I, I think it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting line of thought and inter interesting uh, train of thought that you have. Um, but yes, it feels like, I feel like you fleshed it out and thought about it as much. Uh, <laughs> what, what I mean is I think your project is building some trust back in. Cause when we hear the story of the prisoner who has choked a seven-year-old to death, and I think this is an example you used on Design Matters with Debbie Milliman, then you discover that she was sexually assaulted or raped by her stepfather from age seven to 11 and for four straight years. And she suffered from a form of schizophrenia that she was not aware she had. So the voices that she heard were real to her. And then you start to have compassion for that prisoner when you grow up with judgment for people that are quote unquote in prison or do drugs or or uh, have cheated on their wife or cheated on their husband. And and your, your project in my mind is an ingredient to what I hope to do with this project of mine, which is rebuilding trust, hmm. feeling, connection. I always say at the end of the show, like, I feel you. Like, I feel you out there. Like, I do. I, we play letters. We have a phone number. People call me. Like, it's a community. And I'm trying to create a place. I got no ads on the show. I got no sponsors. I got no, I got no, uh, there's nothing on here that's going to bust my trust because it's that important to me. We have an analog right. mail-in fan club. You know, I love trust and I want it, but I we live in a world where you probably know this, trust is at an all-time low. Like we have an all-time low level of trust in society ever compared to ever. So that's something I'm thinking about. And I just feel like your project lends itself and the evolving morality and not to say you can be a good person, but the evolving morality of like, Everyone has a story. There's there's something behind that and, and uh, resisting the animalistic urge to judge. What a healthy thing for us all to have. Hopefully people reading your project and feeling that, you know, get that out of it too. Yeah. And it's just, again, it's like uh, these aren't ever really, you know, we talk about them because we're on a podcast and we're riffing and we're philosophizing here. But these aren't ever things that I, I focus on. You know, I, I think that's one thing that, um, you know, is kind of beautiful. And I hear my daughter screaming in, in the other room. So maybe, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can wrap up with this. Uh, but the, uh, you know, I think that one, one beautiful thing, and you asked what I've learned uh, and how I've grown. So maybe this all ties in together. Um, so much of this uh, empathy, trust, uh, connection, all of these big words that, you know, people ask me, what role do these play in your work? What I found is that there's something inherent in a story that engenders these things. And that if I focus on the story and telling the story as great as possible and as, as well as I possibly can, then the story becomes a channel for these other things in a way that I don't have to think about them or focus on them, which is something that simplifies my life immensely. All these big words, purpose, mission, impact, connection, love, empathy, all of these big words that other people will put upon my work and ask me what role they play in my work, I can, I can honestly say they play very little role because I have, in order to maintain my sanity and maintain my focus and give myself a sense of control, have decided that I'm going to focus on telling a story in the greatest way I possibly can, the story of a stranger. And the better I get at that, the more of those other words come out of my work because they're inherent in storytelling. There's something inherent about people's stories that the story serves as a vessel for all of those other things which is why the older I get, the more I am focused on that one thing that I want to spend my life trying to get as good as I possibly can get at telling the story, not of the world, not of humanity, but of that single person I meet, the next person that I meet. I want to tell their story as good as I possibly can. And that is my life purpose right now. And you do it so well. 
and the world thanks you for it. Brandon mm. Stanton, thank you. thank you so much for coming on Three Books, sharing so much wisdom and thoughts and philosophy with us. Um, we love uh, your art and your project, and we can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, thank you. This was, uh, it was very uh, cool for me. I really enjoy uh, these opportunities to kind of uh, examine greater themes. It's, it's something I, I don't do very much because I'm so focused on the work itself. So I got a lot out of it too. Thank you, Neil. Hey, everybody, it's just me, just Neil again, hanging at home with my backpack full of wires, listening back to that conversation with Brandon Stanton. So many quotes jump out to me. I don't know which ones to highlight. I'd like to highlight three of them at the end of every chapter just to see if they were the ones that you also underlined or took a note of or wrote down in your commonplace book or added to the notes file on your cell phone. For me, three that I picked up today are number one, you can never judge a person in a moment. Uh, It sounds pithy, but it was quite profound when he told the story of Obama and coming back three months later to the White House and feeling a completely different connection after, of course, only having a moment in the first place. And of course, that is a reflection of the entire work he does on Humans of New York. Two, instead of just sitting around and trying to think of big ideas or having the big moment of inspiration or the wave of passion, I started dividing my life up into the things that I could do, objectives I could accomplish. And the very first big one, probably probably the one that changed my life the most, is that I decided I was going to read 100 pages a day. I want to underline that one because it sounds kind of like loaded up into this paragraph like, yeah, okay, that's obvious. But there's so much to that. Instead of just sitting around thinking of the big idea, having a big moment of inspiration, creating a wave of passion, that's what everyone's asking, right? How do I decide to do what I want? How do I know what I want to do? How do I figure out what I... Forget all that. Just commit to a system that you can actually follow. Reading 100 pages a day. He didn't say what? He didn't say what size font? He didn't say, like, just, there's no, he called them his vegetables, right? Reading on the wealth of nations. But just the idea that I would read 100 pages a day and over time, well, you can do the math. That adds up to a lot of books in a year. Okay, good. Good job, Brandon. Number three, anything you read from compulsion, you are not going to retain nearly as well as what you read from curiosity. Curiosity. Um, I hear so many comments from you guys on three books. You know, you're just like, well, you know, I have too many books in my to read pile from reading to the show. If you're listening to the show, if you're listening to this chapter, if you're at the end, if you added just kids to your list or you added power broker to your list, it's because of curiosity, right? No one's forcing you to do this. This show isn't your vegetables, I don't think. But I love the idea of differentiating between compulsion and curiosity. Ah, thank you so much to Brandon Stanton for giving us three more books to add to our top 1,000. As a reminder, head over to threebooks.co, click the top 1,000, and you will discover a list of every single formative book ever mentioned on this show. Brandon Stanton gave us number 815, Benjamin Franklin, An American Life by Walter Isaacson. Number 814, Just Kids by Patti Smith. Number 813, The Power Broker by Robert Caro. And in addition to all those, he added a smattering of asterisks on the board. You can head over to our FAQ page. Remember when a book gets asterisked, that means somebody else picked it too. Okay, Brandon added a smattering of asterisks. What were they? Well, they were Benjamin Franklin's autobiography and a couple of Ernest Hemingway books. We were also having some chit chats about the Encyclopedia Brown series and where the red fern grows. Those books have not been called by anyone yet, so they are ripe for the taking. But you can visit our FAQ, threebooks.co slash FAQ to find a list of every single book that has been picked more than once. Huge, huge, huge thank you to Brandon for coming on Chapter 63 of Three Books. And now, are you still here? Are you still with us? Are you still listening? Are you driving down in your Toyota Corolla on a highway late at night through some forest or some fields, looking at the time and being like, what is up with this sort of 16 minutes I got left in this show. What is up with the 12 minutes? Is this just Neil rambling? No. No, everyone. You're back. 
You're if you're listening, you're back. You are in the end of the podcast club. You write me, I read your letters, I play your phone calls, we talk about the word of the chapter. We have a little bit of fun together at the end of the show. It's one of three clubs we have for three books members, including the Cover to Cover Club and the Secret Club. You can listen for more details on those other clubs other times. Uh, I'm not going to go into them right now. What I will do is kick off the end of the podcast club like I always do by going to the phones. Hi, Neil. Uh, my name is Diane Stahlbaum. And I currently live in Southern Nevada, and I was born and raised in Indiana. Uh, I was just listening to Chapter 8 with Sarah Anderson, and when, and then it, I was at the point in the conversation where she was saying, uh, talking about the novel um, House, House of Spirits by Isabella, um, I don't know the last name, I can't remember offhand, but, uh, and I mean, that, that was absolutely one of my top three books uh, I've ever read in my entire life. And I've read a lot of good, I've read a lot of really good novels. Um, mm. And uh, anyways, so uh, I, I would strongly suggest and recommend that anybody read that because it was it was just the most enjoyable so enjoyable uh, I can't even I can't even put it in words and so that came up and and I just wanted to recommend that that book and tell you also that I really really I'm loving listening to your podcast and learning and and you know it sounds like I can't wait to read all these books um and the conversations are great. So anyway, oh, um, so thanks, thanks for your podcast, and keep on reading. <laughs> All right, bye. Thank you so much to Diane from Southern Nevada uh, for your phone call. Uh, the book that you underlined, Diane. And I totally forgot that Sarah Anderson and I discussed it high at the top of the CN Tower. Sarah Anderson, of course, the author of Sarah's Scribbles, the viral millennial blogger uh, with millions of followers, eh, not unlike Brandon Stanton in a way, um, because it wasn't one of her three most formative books. She must have discussed it. I recall kind of vaguely now she discussed it kind of on the side, right? This book is called The House of the Spirits, um, a Spanish novel by Isabel Allende. That's A-L-L-E-N-D-E. Again, her first name is Isabel, I-S-A-B-E-L, Allende, e -A -L -L -E -N -D -E. Uh, the novel was rejected by several Spanish language publishers before being published in Buenos Aires in 1982, became an instant bestseller, was critically acclaimed, catapulted Allende to literary stardom, and named best novel of the year in Chile in 1982, now been translated to ah, 37 languages. The story details the life of the Trueba family, spanning four generations, tracing the post-colonial social and political upheavals of Chile through the country's name and the names of figures closely paralleling historical ones, such as the president or the poet, etc. Uh, a wonderful book, it sounds like, which I have not read, that came out in 1982 from Isabel Allende called The House of the Spirits. And thank you so much to Diane for giving us a big underline on that. Okay. And now it is time for the letter of the chapter. And for this chapter's letter, we go to a gentleman named Luke M. Hi, Neil. Two weeks ago, I didn't know you existed. Today, I have an inexplicable hope that we can be best friends for life. I was really thinking I should read all your books and become part of the Cover to Cover Club before reaching out to you so I could have the most knowledgeable attempt to impress you and catch your attention. But my wife convinced me I should just go ahead and reach out now. While my excitement level is high, because who knows what will come tomorrow. Um, let me start by explaining how I got to be here. My 13-year-old daughter was at the bookstore a few weeks ago and she bought You Are Awesome because she liked the title and it was on display out front. She read about half the book before handing it over to my wife, who read all of it before handing it over to me and telling me I had to read it. It was around 9 p.m. when I started reading and I was about two-thirds complete at around 1 a.m. when my 17-year-old son came home from the basement or came up from the basement, to tell me about his experience at the church that day, where he was the first to notice and investigate a break-in. We live four doors down from the church, and he spends a lot of time there alone practicing piano, playing basketball, and Skyping with his friends. Long story short, it led to a three-hour-long discussion about the past, present, future, and purpose of life. 
epic. Thankfully, your book put me in a perfect state of mind to be there for him when he needed me, and I am very grateful for that alone. I finished reading your book the next morning as soon as I got up, and then I proceeded to research you and your blog over the next several days. I am also a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I served my two-year mission in Sapporo, Japan. Imagine my surprise when perusing your podcast, I see a picture of one of our favorite missionaries ever to grace the North. Elder Cox ate at our home most Wednesdays, and he was very close to all of us. We had a great time listening to the full podcast, chapter 36, with him last Sunday, as a family, after our home sacrament service. I think they did a pretty good job with all your questions, except for maybe the mild awkwardness around your question about the church's stance on homosexuality. I like how you rephrased it a couple times to try to get an actual answer, and they kept dodging the question until you finally let it slide and changed the topic. The actual answer right now is unfortunately no. You cannot currently be a member of the church in good standing and a practicing homosexual. You can, of course, come to the church anytime, as we welcome all people equally with open arms, including murderers, bigots, racists, and homosexuals. All horrible jokes aside, the LGBTQ stance of the church is one of the toughest political topics that I have struggled immensely with over the past 13 years, particularly since watching An Inconvenient Truth significantly changed my outlook on life and led me to become a local candidate for the Green Party and evolve my political and religious views in an extreme way. That being said, I'm still an active member trying to change the church from within as much as I can. I hope someday soon we will be able to modify our stance to be fully open to families and orientations of all shapes and sizes. Whatever direction the world takes, I fully agree we need to enjoy each day as much as possible. And reading more books is a wonderful way to broaden our horizons and experience thousands of lifetimes worth of adventure and excitement in a comparatively short time. This brings me back full circle to your podcast on why I'm so grateful to you and the work you're doing to unite book lovers around the world in a major way. Efforts like these are so crucial to bridge the many gaps that and break down the walls dividing us so we can truly start to feel like one global family. All our other problems become so much easier to solve the more united that we are in this way. Your new forever friend, Luke. (sighs) Ah. I am so touched, Luke, by your note, by your letter. What a small world. Elder Cox and Elder Corona, as you guys will remember, if you're in the Cover to Cover Club, were the guests of chapter 36 of three books. And for Elder Cox, uh, who I've exchanged a few emails with more recently and who seems to be doing really, really well, uh, to have been eating in Luke's home and Luke's listening to the podcast and reading my book. Like, what a small world. It really is a small world after all. And I'm sorry for putting that song in all of your heads. Okay. And now, now it is time. It is time. It is time for the word of the chapter. And for this chapter's word, let's go back to Brandon. While at the same time getting everything right, getting all the facts right, and elucidating. Yes, indeed, it is elucidate. E L U C I D A T E. Elucidate. Elucidate. A transitive verb meaning to make lucid, especially by explanation or analysis, or an intransitive verb to give a clarifying explanation. Are we elucidating elucidate right now? I think we are. Uh, a good way to remember this because. Heaven knows, I forget myself. Um, elucidate comes from E, is to elucidate, is to make something clear that was formerly murky or confusing. Elucidate traces to the Latin term lucidus, L U C I D U S, which means to shine. So elucidating can be thought of as the figurative equivalent of shining a light on something to make it easier to see. E, lucidate, shine on to something to make it easier to see what we are trying to do, of course, with the word of the chapter, what we are trying to do with the greatest themes in the entire world with this entire podcast. Thank you all so much for listening to chapter 63 on the full moon of three bucks with Brandon Stanton. And until next time, remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning that page and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.